Ready? <laughs> All right, Kiana Tufano, I'll uh, call the meeting to order. Can everyone grab a seat, please? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Everybody for coming along. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see councillors in the flesh in 3D. It's wonderful to, to be in the same room together again. Uh, we have some attendees by Zoom, etc. And it's lovely to see such a full uh, public gallery. And it's lovely to see so many media here. So um, you're all welcome in this room. I'll lay this down here and now. We are here to come up with the best possible outcomes for our community. This is the uh, community meeting, a community committee meeting. Um, so I will be insisting that we speak in a way that others want to listen and we listen in a way that others want to speak. We are all here with our own different views. There are some very strong views. There have been some strong words spoken. Uh, and while I appreciate that, this is the place to come up with great solutions. So we will be respectful. Um, we'll be playing the issue and not the person. And we will all hear things we don't like today. But those, we will use that energy to come up with great solutions for our uh, community. So that is the way we'll be running this meeting today. I'll be firm, fair, and as friendly as I possibly can. So we'll declare the uh, meeting open at 10.01 this morning. We move straight to apologies. We have uh, apologies from Councillor Forsyth and Councillor uh, Omangai Thompson Evans for the entire meeting, and we wish them well. Uh, uh, Mayor Southgate. I'm actually speaking on a live podcast to Brazil because um, Hamilton said, I want to say this on the public record, Hamilton City has been acknowledged as being exemplary in the way that it coped with COVID for their communities. And we've been invited to talk to the Brazilian government and other mayors from around the world as to what we did. So that's what I'll be doing when I duck out. Thanks. Okay. And a big thanks to staff because in a large part, of course, that is the staff that had got, got us through COVID. And I just want that acknowledged. Thank you, Mayor Southgate. Um, further uh, apologies um, uh, from Councillor Sarah, I believe. You'll be in and out, and she's there on Zoom at the moment. You may see her up there. It's all very techn uh, technological. Um, Mango Ali? Apologies from 1.30 to 3.30. 1.30 to 3.30, cool. And Councillor Van Oosten? And I have to leave the meeting at 3, uh, okay. 3.15. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. Now, I will um, mention that we have photographers here from the media. You've all been briefed that they will be here. Um, keep your eye out for the lenses, but stay focused on the meeting. Um, yep. Uh, just so, uh, just to mention to the photographers, we have a suck in time of 18 seconds, so please make it quick when you're taking your snaps. Um, so I'd like to move that those apologies be accepted. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Those in favour, say aye. Right. How's your hands? Thank you. And against? Unanimous. Confirmation of the agenda. Now, as you'll see if you look down the run sheet, it, uh, it doesn't follow a natural numerical order based on items. What we have tried to do is set the agenda based on when people are in and out and when we have guests in the, uh, in the chamber. Um, you'll note that after lunch is when we will be uh, taking on the municipal pool demolition item 10, and then the Captain Hamilton statue will be immediately following that uh, as order of business. I'll thank you in advance for your indulgence if we do need to move stuff around to fill in time. So um, with that in mind, we will, I'll put out that. Oh, certainly. Yep. I'm just wondering why we can't move the Captain Hamilton up since um, media are, are here and then they can go. <laughs> yeah, OK. okay. To speak to that, and just I apologise to, to the media as I came in. But yes, OK. Um, I apologise to the media when I came in, but I think it's imperative that I'm in that debate and discussion, and I can't be here at 11 um, because I'm virtually in Brazil. So um, otherwise, I would have suggested that very same action myself. Okay. And is that you happy with that, Angela? Yeah. Or oh, does that answer choice. your question? <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. I'm, I'm satisfied with that. Um, but uh, I'll put that out for um, for the vote. We'll move that the agenda or that be accepted. All those in favour? Oh, do we have a seconder? Oh, Martin, thank you. Excellent. All righty then. So, um, declarations of interest. Do we have any? Councillor Gallagher. Uh, yes, with regard to item 15, uh, I had a, I'd had declared an historical conflict many years ago because of perception. Yep. 
uh, given the broad issues to be discussed today, that uh, conflict does not apply. Well done, Marty. It's only taken eight years. <laughs> Brought up. All right. OK, so uh, you were declaring um, that you had had a conflict in the past, but... No conflict. OK, absolutely. I'll hold you to that no conflict line, literally. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Any other de declarations of interest? All right, and we'll move on to the public forum. So, public, we will ask that you come up to this seat up here. You'll have five minutes. I will be very strict on time today, uh, respectfully, because uh, we do have a very full public forum today. Uh, so you'll have five minutes uh, to make your uh, statement and answer questions. So that will include question time. <laughs> Members, if you are um, wanting to ask a question, put your name up there very, very quickly. Um, because at the five minute bell, if your name's still up there, there's still a question unanswered, I'm afraid we'll have to move on. Do we understand? Okay, great. So we'll start with Catherine Lucatina, please, representing Sink or Swim. I ask you to come on up. So Catherine, your time is there. A bell will ring at four minutes, and then you'll have another minute to, to wrap up or take questions. Yep, we'll sort that out for you. Hold the clock. Mm -hmm. been the on to Sorry? Yes, it has actually. If, if, if um, councillors, if you look at um, the very last item on diligent, you'll be able to find it there in the public forum presentations under Catherine Licatina. Do we have it up? Yep, it's coming. It's yep. coming up? Okay. Please wait while technology keeps catches up with us. And if you're wanting to see it on your screens down here, you hit discussion and then double click on there. Need your? So welcome, your five minute starts, thank you. To item 10, um, about the municipal pools. Next slide, please. So who is Sink or Swim? We are a group of um, advocating for the refurbishment of the munis to ameliorate Hamilton's uh, shortage of swimming space, which is quite dire. And the reason we're here today is because we support the deferral of the demolition of the municipal pools until Hamilton City Council develops a plan for redevelopment of the site as a public outdoor swimming complex. And this should be accomplished as a shovel-ready project within the 20-minute city plan. It will meet the needs of the swimming public within the CBD, and it will preserve the heritage aspects of the site. Um, our next slide in this uh, slide four, please. Um, so a little bit about the history of the municipal pools while we're waiting for the slide. Um, in December 2012, the pools opened. In the mid-1990s, Hamilton City Council decided to stop maintaining the facility. It was <clears throat> closed in February 2012 against a lot of public opposition to that closure. Uh, there's been various LTPs and uh, annual plans and all the rest of it. And then late last year, the consent to demolish. And I would note that at every stage of the process, the public has overwhelmingly opposed the closure and demolition of the munis. Next slide, please. Um, now let's talk about the 20-minute city. It requires that most of the facilities and activities for the economic, social, environmental or cultural well-being of citizens are available within a 20-minute cycle ride or walk from their home. And Hamilton City wants 500 million for transport infrastructure, but none for actual facilities. Next slide, please. So for the 20-minute city, Hamilton is chronically short of swimming lane space Many Hamilton swimmers have to travel to Matamata, 50 minutes, Huntley, 35 minutes, Lake Pukaterini, Huntley, 35 minutes, Te Awamutu, 25 minutes, Raglan Harbour, 50 minutes to get a swim. Now, to make a 20-minute city, you need to have 20-minute facilities. 
How does Hamilton, uh, next slide please, how does Hamilton compare with other cities? Well, compared to Tauranga, Wellington, Christchurch and Dunedin, we're doing really badly. There's 8,000 people per swimming lane in Hamilton compared to about six for the other cities. Now, how does Hamilton, next slide please, how does Hamilton compare with our neighbours? This is from your own report, the Waikato Regional Aquatic Facilities Plan. Hamilton City does not meet any of the seven criteria in the action plan. Next slide, please. So the municipal pools meet many council objectives, and um, I'll leave them there for you to read at your leisure. Next slide, please. Um, and the benefits, the municipal pools confer significant benefits for the city. They're in the heart of the city, close to uh, high-density workers, um, schools and housing near the hotels, which don't have their own pools. It's on the orbiter and it's on the river path. You've got uh, one minute if you want to carry on. Or... Okay, no, that's it. Um, I'll take a question if you like. Okay, any questions uh, from councillors at this point? No, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, right, next we'll have uh, Isabella and Christina Campbell speaking to item 10 on the municipal pools. And welcome home, by the way. Isabella's one of our newer residents. So again, you'll have um, five minutes, um, yes. including questions. So thank you very much. This is Morena, yep. Tina Koto. Mayor Paula Southgate and councillors of Kitty Kitty Roar, advocates for our city, is that it is an honour to speak today in favour of retaining the municipal pool site, Victoria Street, for the use and benefit of our citizens to swim safely outdoors in our city. I'm Christina Campbell, Isabella's daughter, a registered nurse and midwife with a particular interest in the health and well-being of present and future generations. I never intended to stay long in this city, but when I discovered the municipal pools, downtown Hamilton, it was like an unbelievable hidden secret. And I decided that I could live here. For me, it made the city livable. It was the happiest and most vibrant place. People of all ages, sizes and cultures, combining music, laughter and exercising, whilst connecting with the outdoor environment. Trees, vegetation, the sky, birds, all weather and fresh air. All beneficial for optimum health and building communities. 20 years on, the pools lie neglected. Our population has increased by over 60,000 people. The city centre has intensified. Obesity rates, deprivation and mental health issues have soared. We need to urgently address the need for such a previously successful feel-good scene to be returned to the people. It is essential that the site is retained for the purpose of an outdoor swimming complex because the site is perfect. In a city, easy to walk to, cycle, bus, scooter or drive to with plenty of parking. Owned and operated by council so that it remains an asset of the citizens for the benefit of the citizens. The slides shown give you a view of outdoor pools as opposed to indoor pools, connecting one with the environment. The top one, uh, the top one is at Tekapul, a well-known and popular tourist attraction in the South Island. The next one is of Dunedin's complex of outdoor pools, a spa pool, lap pool and cold plunge pool. The next one are popular Mount Manganui pools, a large tepid swimming pool, a large relaxing spa with massage jets and children's pool and slide. That's the next one. A cafe, retail and massage therapy add extra revenue. It's always busy all year round. Next slide. And it's open in the evenings, an attractive and healthy evening activity for all ages. Next slide. 
The costs, money was not plentiful 100 years ago, but this facility was important for our community. Consider engaging local iwi in a partnership model to make this a sacred health investment for Kiri Kiri Roa. <coughs> Next slide. This slide shows the current pools, so sad, but look beyond the neglected walls. It's a haven amongst trees and an open sky. Think of the possibilities. Next slide. This is what is beyond the neglected walls. Beautiful landscape and space to replace and enhance or expand the pools. It's next to the rowing club and river, known as the Ferry Bank, a historic site where early Māori and settlers landed. Let's embrace this site, open it up for our people and celebrate our environment and rich diversity of our city. We next slide. We have a window of opportunity. Our future generations are worth investing in. Kiri Kiri Roa, Tuhinga or Mua, or Hamilton, City of the Future. My mother, Isabella, has a short statement. Good morning, councillors and friends. I am Isabella Campbell, 92 years old. Hamilton is a wonderful progressive city of trees, parks and people. One of my secrets for keeping in good mental and physical health is I wholeheartedly embrace exercise, my favourite being outdoor swimming. But sadly, Hamilton lacks what most cities have, decent outdoor swimming in the city. The empty municipal pool seriously needs attention to revitalise, yes, yes, Let's move forwards and improve the good pool complex on the prime site for all Hamilton citizens, including myself. Thank you. Thank you for coming along. Okay. Uh, next, we'd ask uh, Alex Wilkinson and Yasmin Davis from the Waikato Society of Potters, speaking to item number six which is the Community Occupancy Applications. Welcome, guys. Again, you'll have uh, five minutes, and the bell will ping at one minute to go. Um, so that does include questions if you want to open yourself up to questions. Thank you. OK. Do you have an audiovisual? Uh, nothing pictorial? No, no. no like a sculpture or a pot of wheel? We'll think of that next time. <laughs> OK. All right. You're welcome, guys. Right. Uh, Maureen, uh, my name is uh, Yasmin Davis. I'm a a tutor currently at the Waikato Society of Potters, um, and I've got a background in physiotherapy. And we're here to talk regarding the community occupation um, aspect for the Waikato Society of Potters. So just a little bit of who we are. Um, the Waikato Society of Potters is quite a thriving art space in Hamilton. We've got members all across the, the Waikato region. We do anything to try and support and highlight pottery, sculpture, all things ceramic. And we've got quite a rich history spanning almost 50 years. We're going to have our 49th um, exhibition, yearly exhibition at the end of this year. Our society offers um, services to both the general public and to our members. Uh, we're open to anyone, any age, any background, any ability. We've got quite a few people who have special needs of one way or other. And um, we have quite a few people who come to us um, in regards to basically help with their mental health um, and work it out through clay, which is quite, um, it's been quite encouraging to see how well some of that works. Um, we attract um, hundreds of people and, and residents to us every week, really. Um, we're open every day of the week in one form or the other. We provide a safe environment for people of all walks of life, like I said, and um, 
we continue to encourage that. When I started about nine years ago here, um, we had, I remember we, we got over the 100 mark for our members and it was a big thing. Now, um, last, 300. the 304 was our last count um, and we're growing quite fast. It's, it seems to be sort of going up quite steeply. Now, our goals and aspirations is, as a Waikato Society protest, we are a non-for-profit society, and what we're really um, wishing is to continue to occupy the space that we currently have, because it's an ideal space. It's right in the heart of the city. We have got good parking for um, our members, especially looking at um, our members that might otherwise be um, hindered from coming just through physical ability to get to us. Um, so um, that's, that's one of the key parts. We promote um, anything from casual um, use of the facilities through to classes, evening classes, and we also run a diploma course for a, a satellite facility that's run from Dunedin, but we provide the facilities to do that. So we've got the whole width of um, um, possibilities for people to use our space. Um, we're very, very keen on sharing the resources uh, with the whole public, with schools, with special uh, groups, um, yeah, again, of any age, any um, background. Um, I think you better say you a bit. No, I'm really here just to agree with Yasmin and back her up. Um, we really just want to stay in the wonderful location we are um, and we really help the community delve into their creative um, areas, which is something that's a little bit lost in our crazy lives. Mm. And um, just being clay, we found is very grounding, literally. <laughs> um, and it's it's wonderful to see what um, what people, yeah, when supported in a in a warm and welcoming way, um, will come up with and um, how they can thrive from um, sometimes very sad backgrounds. Yeah. Any questions? Well, any questions? We have about thirty seconds for questions, if there are any. Well, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Kia ora. Hope to see you there. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> After that commercial <laughs> plug, you should be filling the hall. Fantastic. <laughs> Yay! Great. Okay, um, we'll ask uh, Robin Hood to speak to item number 10, please, uh, the municipal pool. Robin, welcome. Um, and do you have a, a visual presentation, Robin, or is it just straight to speaking? Straight thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, so again, your time will be up there on the clock for you to see quite clearly, and the bell will ring at one minute yeah, to go. Go. Yep. Morena. Morena. Chairman, uh, Chairman Bunting, Madam Mayor, Councillors, I'm talking to item 10. I totally support sink or swim and the persuasive, uh, persuasive and totally valid reasons to preserve the old municipal pool. My perspective to you today addresses history. History which is faithfully, faithfully, faithfully recorded and available online. It is extensive. This pool has enough historic pedigree to sink a ship and to allow it to be neglected to the point of dilapidation where it is convenient to justify its demolition and consignment to the dump is, with due respect, threadbare treatment indeed. It's unbecoming to the city that has grown from the raw cow town of the 1940s and the 1950s to become proudly one of the three economic hubs of the Golden Triangle in this country. Having stated my view clearly and respect uh, respectfully and contrary to the professional opinions that Council have sought, please allow me to offer an economic solution. Before doing so, please permit me to remind you of the place this pool has in the history of this city. It is not only, not only has the Munis been a place where a passing parade of generations learned to swim, to dive and play safely, and then all adults who used the, and exercised the pool during quieter hours. It has also been a place that gave rise to a passing parade of great aquatic champions in swimming, diving and water polo, and that challenged as equals the then powerhouses of Auckland, Wellington and Canterbury. 
It was also a place where two great coaches, the late Bob Frankham, Royal Honours, British Empire Medal for swimming services, and the late Merv Campbell, Royal Honours, member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to diving, they nurtured squadrons of competent swimmers and divers and stables of national champions, but also international competitors, Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games, World Championships, World Cups, including finalists and medalists in these events. If my information from public media reporting is correct, Council is budgeting about one million to demolish and remove this facility. Here's my solution. Stabilise the existing pool by boring, say, three 400 millimetre holes through the concrete floor of the pool, near the old deep end where I assume the underlying unstable foundation is located, and I'm told, or we have all been told, is leaking, to a depth of, say, 10 metres and fill with reinforced concrete columns. Obviously, this procedure is engineer-centric, but is, commonly, is a commonly used technique. Uh, filling, the reinforced con fill, filling with reinforced concrete and tied into the existing floor. Install a stainless steel pool liner with the lane marking, starter blocks, filter systems, etc. Leaking and unstable problems solved. Steel pools are common throughout the world and such a specialist company is based in Christchurch as an extension of the US-based operation. The company has already provided assistance to Council in respect of the Tarapa water world, so it's, an un it's a known quantity. Fourth, the historic stand can remain in place and incorporated into an aquatic hall of fame, which we need in this proud town. Five, modify, modify the old learn to swim area to incorporate a deep a steel deep water pool complete with one and three metre springboard diving boards for use by the public and the police deep water training and scuba diving training. I, for one, would be uh, would commit to don donating a three metre uh, Maxiflex springboard and Euroflex stand and undertake to find a fellow donor for the one metre Maxiflex springboard and Euroflex stand to spend $1 million to demolish and remove the old pool when it could be productively used to be rehabilitated. Rehabilitated speaks for itself. This rehabilitation is in complete harmony with the proposed sink or swim and water quarter concept, which I also support. Questions? Thank you, Robin. Do we have any questions from uh, elected members? Robin, thank you for your thank you, really Mr. positive Chair. and constructive uh, submission. Thank you, sir. Um, we'll go to Zoom now, and we have two people in the waiting room. This is, uh, where are we there? Uh, David Platts and Charlie Cooper. Now, they'll be speaking, uh, representing the Hamilton Astronomical Society, and they are speaking to item number six about the community occupancy applications. So, we'll just, there's Charlie there. Hi, Charlie, can you hear us? Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Can everyone hear yeah, awesome. me? Yep. Um, so, we're just speaking, I'm speaking on behalf of the Hamilton Astronomical Society uh, ahead of our request to Hamilton City Council to renew our lease for the next 10 years. Um, we're currently situated up next to the zoo on Brimer Road, and the council has plans for that area. Um, and we've been in discussions with the council over our lease for, and um, how that lease is going to change. Uh, so that we can keep the society in place while we allow the council to develop around us. Um, so I thought I'd just give you a quick overview of, of the Hampton Astronomical Society and what we do um, ahead of you making that decision on the lease. Um, so we were founded in the 1940s, so the society's been around for an awfully long time. Um, and we've been on that site in Brown Road for since 1981. Um, we currently have a paid membership of 64 people, and that's growing all the time. Uh, we have four or five new sign-ups every week, um, and we're working to grow that as fast as possible. Um, we, we operate uh, member nights and public nights, um, so nights for the public to come up and, and look through the telescopes, as well as our member based. Um, and we also run uh, private events, and we've, had, we've worked with the zoo for many years um, to host uh, sleepover evenings, which have they combine zoo tours during the day and astronomy during the night. 
We've recently received funding of $3,000 from Hamilton City Council for a uh, single year community grant to help us with our annual operating expenses. Um, we've also recently received $7,000 from the Well Energy Trust to help us repair uh, and maintain the dome, um, which uh, the dome houses our 24 inch telescope, uh, which was built by members in, 90, in the 90s. And we're working to refurbish that um, to bring it back to uh, modern spec for um, the society members and the public to use. Um, we're, help, we're holding our AGM in August, um, and our, the current committee goals for next year are to expand our member base, to run more ac events and activities uh, aimed specifically at younger members of the public and members, younger members. Um, we want to increase the diversity of the society with more women, more young members, and more, uh, build a more culturally diverse member base. Uh, with, we're wanting to carry out some much needed maintenance across the building and the telescopes. Uh, and our general goal is to provide scientific education to the public um, and support our members in learning about astronomy and experiencing the night sky. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a quick summary of, of, of what we do. Um, and I hope that informs your decision about uh, our lease renewal. Thank you very much, David. Uh, is Char uh, Charlie Rother, is uh, David going to say anything? or? Uh sitting there in the waiting room. Uh, hello, I, hi, I, I'm here, David Platt's here. I'm supporting Charlie in the event that Zoom technology fails us, so I'm very happy to let uh, Charlie's presentation speak for itself. Thank you. Very good indeed. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, any uh, questions from elected members for our Astronomical Society? Or are you all starstruck? Councillor McPherson. I do, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yep. They just noticed that the new lease area doesn't include your satellite dish. What's the story there? Um, so we've agreed with council to reduce the uh, our lease area. Um, back the back paddock has been reduced significantly, and it cuts out the current uh, radio telescope. So that radio telescope will be removed and scrapped because um, it's not in use currently. Um. Uh, hasn't been for some time, uh, and that will allow Hamilton City Council to use that land. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Oh, Councillor Van Oosten. Um, yeah, just one question from me with regard to um, uh, cultural awareness, and have um, uh, has the society um, uh, partnered in any way with local iwi to help to celebrate the Matariki um, uh, events and celebrations that happen annually? Um, we, we have in the past partnered with um, cultural experts from Waikato University at Matariki time, and we do run a Matariki event every year. Um, and we, we do try and um, encourage people to, to come to that and, and try to make it um, more of a cultural experience than purely an astronomical one. Um, this year, obviously, COVID got in the way of that, so we haven't really done much around Matariki. We, we definitely like to do more around it next year. Um, and we're very much open to talking to Iwi about um, about how to make it better for the public. Very good. We'll take that as an invitation to Council of Van Oosten. That's fantastic. Excellent. Any other questions? And look at that, how ironic the Astronomical Society have space. Outstanding. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not my finest work. OK, moving on. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> One soup. You're right. We're now... Any other bad jokes coming? We've still got time? No? Great. OK. Uh, Judy Patterson, could we uh, have your up? Hello, Judy. Uh, kia ora and welcome. Now, Judy, do you have uh, a visual...? Staff, we've got that. Got that there, team? OK, Judy, again, you'll have um, five minutes, including questions. Um, and... Much more else I can say, you know, the one-minute bell will go and, and off we go. Um, we'll just get this set up. If you could think amongst yourselves at the moment. There we go. Thank you. Right. Good morning, uh, Chair Brun Brunting and uh, Madam Mayor and assembled councillors and uh, friends and, and public. 
Um, I'd like to speak this morning on, my name is Judy Patterson, and I have been a resident of Hamilton for 46 years. And one of the delights I had on arriving in the city was to find the Hamilton um, Municipal Pools. And um, I come from the great city of Wanganui, uh, as does Robin Hood, um, with his illust illustrious background of doing handstands on the Jury Hill Water Tower as a diver. So i um, just like to acknowledge he's very humble. Um, he's actually got uh, a QSM and um, uh, he's an international diver and uh, judge and administrator. So we, and uh, um, Chair Brunting, I'm an Aquarian. So aqua, water, water bearer, you know, um, just let you in on that. So I'd like to, hang on, pause the clock please, we'll because we don't have the PowerPoint. Members, this is also on diligent um, down there if you get lost. It's kind of like swimming in the water, isn't it? I'm going to wait for this. There we go. Okay, guys? Right, next slide, please. Thank While you. While I, I submitted this proposal, um, uh, prior to the um, gov um, central government's um, offer of uh, spade-ready projects. And I submitted this to uh, the council um, as a proposal for a water quarter. Now, international cities have Latin quarters and French quarters and other kinds of quarters. The great city of New York has the garment quarter, the financial, uh, sorry, the garment district, the financial district and um, the meat uh, workers district. So they can designate these places as, as uh, tourist attractions in their fantastic cities. We could have a water quarter here in Hamilton. The, f the foundation stone of which would be the municipal pools. And while I was extremely disappointed that um, we didn't make it to the, um, uh, the government um, spade-ready thing, it's actually fortuitous because this council came up with the idea of the 20-minute city. So I've now been able to include on this the, the um, bike path. And I hope that from my home, I can bike to the municipal pool along a cycleway. I'm wearing my bicycle earrings today because I'm a cyclist. Last year, I biked from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean across France, and I appreciate the value, 650 Ks, um, and I appreciate the value of designated walking and uh, cycling pathways. Fantastic experience, do it, it's wonderful. So to have that cycle way, a 20 minute city to be able to bike from my place to the, to the municipal pools, magnificent. I've listed, next slide please, a whole lot of benefits uh, there, what the water quarter would look like and uh, who it would support, um, including um, the existing rowing club and Waka Armour site and possible uh, kayaking club and so on. Next slide, please. And the one after that. Thank you. So, um, most importantly, I've put in there tourist booking office because we have this uh, New Zealand cycleway, walkway, the whole distance of, um, of the country. Imagine a, a walker or a cyclist arriving down at Ferry Bank in the water quarter, seeing a fantastic swimming pool to be able to dive in and have a swim at the end of six or eight hours walking in a day. Fantastic. Next slide, please. There could be all sorts of uh, activities from that tourist centre. Packages of a swim in the 
pool and a trip out or cycle out to the Avanti Drome, have a cycle on the public experience day. Fantastic. Let us have some imagination about this. Let us explore the possibilities of a water quarter. From I've done a, a search on the great um, uh, encyclopedia of the internet, the Google, and there is no other city in the world which has a water quarter. Let's be a world first. New Zealand's water quarter. Thank, Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much for your impassioned and positive submission. Really appreciate that. And we'd ask Gail Johnson, who's our final speaker today, to come forward on, you guessed it, the municipal pools. Thank you. Welcome, Gail. I'll, I'll tell you what I've told everybody else. Five cool. minutes. Uh, do you have a, an audio visual? No. Good. Um, and the bell will go at one minute. So right. you're welcome. Thank the you. Floor's yours. Thanks very much, and we'll, um, thank you very much for having, allowing me some time to speak. Um, I'm a born and bred Hamiltonian, um, and my introduction to the um, municipal pool started when I was about four, uh, when my family were already members, my brother and sister, and my parents. And for the next 15 years, I swam out of the swimming pool, and I still, even though it's empty, <laughs> consider it my home pool. Um, I went on to represent New Zealand 10 times, including a Commonwealth Games and Olympic um, representation, and I'm currently the World Masters Games title holder in four swimming events. Um, every day is a great day for an outdoor swim. It's my motto. <laughs> um, swimming is an excellent form of exercise. There's no impact, it's weightless, and for recovery, especially for anyone who's injured, um, it's recommended by nearly everybody. Outdoor swimming adds to the experience, um, exposure to vitamin D, and there's no, um, the air, an outdoor area is less contaminated than an indoor swimming pool. Um, but it's simply a pleasure to connect to the open air while in water. There is simply nothing else like it. Presently, to do that, you've got to travel to Matamata for, any, for a swim all year round. And... There's no facilities for an outdoor swimming pool here in Hamilton all year round. Currently there are three swimming clubs in, in Hamilton that offer an avenue to competitive swimming. Uh, Fairfield Swimming Club is reinventing itself after the sudden death of their head coach. But they have around 60 to 80 swimmers um, and they swim out of Fairfield swim College from Term 1 and 4 of the school year. But in Term 2 and 3 they literally have to downsize so they can be squeezed into Tarapa to swim. Um, Hamilton Aquatics Club is a fairly new club and they have over 300 members and a waiting list for new members because they have no space. And they swim out of Tarapa Pool. Uh, they also have lanes in Boys High and Hillcrest Normal Schools. St Paul's is basically a private club because it's based at the school on Hokanui Road and they have a 25 metre outdoor swimming pool that's open all year round. <coughs> Um, and speaking on schools, fewer and fewer schools offer this life-saving skill. Um, and with a river running through our city, it's an essential one for all Hamiltonians. The municipal pool is within walking distance of six big schools. And they regularly all w walked from there uh, over 10 years ago. <laughs> Marion School spent over $6,000 on transport alone to get their children to Tarapa to Swimming Pool. That's crazy. They could walk. In the last 10 years, the number of people who dom domiciled in the central city has risen humongously, and they're all within easy walking distance of the municipal pools, and it's not slowing down. I'm also the president of the Waikato Sport, uh, Police Sport, as I work as the file manager in the Hamilton Central Police Station. There are hundreds of staff at the central station alone who have missed out and who did religiously use the municipal pools. Swim testing um, are a requirement for officers to advance into branches such as the Armed Defender Squad or DPS, diplomatic protection squads, and having a pool on, the do on their doorstep was huge. Um, my office is on the fifth floor and I daily look out at the municipal pools and I literally am in tears. Every day is a great day for an outdoor swim. 
I have great memories of the pool, but I would swim there again without hesitation and every day if I could. So apart from competitive swimmers, other people scrambling for pool space in Hamilton are divers, water polo players, flipper ball players, who are now limited because of the deepening of the Tarapa pool, underwater hockey players, canoe polo, surf lifesaving clubs, master swimmers, fitness swimmers, recreational swimmers, triathletes, aqua joggers, synchronised swimmers, and many more. And then there's the members of the public who just want to splash and play safely. The idea has been muted to have shared pool facilities with public um, and education departments. They don't work, I can tell you that now. Access to, the, to them in school hours is limited, if not non-existent. Um, every day is a great day for an outdoor swim. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, uh, your submission today. I think unless there's any burning questions, um, we'll let you go. You did well. Thank you. <laughs> no questions? Thank you very much for your, for your submission today. And submitters, thank you very much for the respectful way you presented today. Uh, and thank you, members, for the respectful way you listened. Thank you. Now, your item um, for the pools is the first item after lunch. We're aiming to have lunch at 1 for 45 minutes, uh, so about a quarter to if you want to come back. All right. Thank you. All right, members, we will, um, thank you for that. We will move on to item numero seven, which is the Hamilton Age Friendly Plan Annual Update. So Dame Peggy would ask you to... We'll pop you up the end there, I think. That's all right. So welcome Dame Petty, Biggie, it's lovely to have you here. Um, the staff recommendation is that the community committee receives the report and requests staff report back to the community committee by the end of 2020 on options for reviewing the age friendly plan. I'll move that to get that on the table and seconded by Councillor Kish. Nick, the floor is yours to do the introductions and away you go. Great. Um, good morning to the Chair and to Councillors. Um, so, as you said before, here's the, the annual update on progress made on the age-friendly plan for Hamilton. Just as a reminder, the, uh, the plan is a community-led plan. Uh, there's over 20 organisations around the, the city who are contributing to this plan. Um, it's about two years into um, its, um, its progress now. Um, and um, Dame Peggy is here to give you some of the, the more detail about what has happened over the last year of the plan. Um, is there anything else that I need to say beforehand? I don't think so. I can pass over to Dame Peggy to, to give you an update on that and we'd be happy to answer any questions once she's done that. Thank you. Uh, Marina, um, people of the council and members of the public, I've been here before and that was to do as this morning to give a report. Uh, at last count, about two hours ago, Hamilton had 19,005 people over 65 which is 11.8% of our population, let's say one in 10, and we are all getting older. Um, some of older people are disabled. Some older people are doing very nicely, thank you. Some are in the workforce, and some are around the table here. Uh, and some are giving submissions. I do not know the lady, but thank you for coming. So they make a valuable contribution to uh, our, <coughs> our city, including the work of our voluntary organisation that I chair, the Age Friendly Steering Group. Uh, we are either um, in a, a voluntary organisation or an organisation or um, a retired person. Essentially, the group um, is already uh, makes connections with existing groups in the Hamilton and suggests to them that they focus a little more their activities on older people. And so our, our role is really a negotiation um, group and we have a set of projects, 48 of them um, in this plan. The, the group actually arose from an advisory group to the Hamilton City Council, which I have to tell you has existed since 1993, I think. Um, this, this city 
despite being one of the youngest in the, in the country, has an amazing record on looking after its old people. So in general, I think we can be very proud of the record um, that we have. The four-year plan that, that I am speaking to um, is on the web. There are 48 projects, a third of them uh, uh, backed by the Hamilton City Council, but in conjunction with other voluntary groups. And in the report that you also have, <clears throat> you will notice that there are two groups who feature quite highly in their involvement, the Rao Awawa Kamatua Charitable Trust and also Age Concern. I'd like to acknowledge them. Um, I'd like to um, uh, you please in this session not only to, as you have done before, perhaps comment on particular projects, but where we might go f further. This plan uh, is hoped to be achieved by next year. Because it's a community development style of group, some of the projects may not get there. Uh, because people have gone somewhere else or whatever. Uh, and we needn't be too upset about that. But there are also many projects that are also being um, thought, thought up as we go. Um, I would like to just uh, comment on uh, the work that your facilities group in the Hamilton City Council has done uh, with respect to a lot of the improved facilities we have in this uh, city for older people, but what is good for older people is usually okay for everybody. And if it is by universal design, as our bus stops are, with a gap at the end for the wheelchair or the pushchair or your handbag, um, that is what we call universal design. It's for, for everybody. Um, I'd also like to, to um, uh, thank the Hamilton City Council for their customer service. Uh, the people on your front deck, uh, front desk, uh, are a very welcoming crew, and that gives a nice impression with older people who, after all, are a fair group of ratepayers. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleague here, Nick Chester, and Judy Small from the Hamilton City Council. Uh, and, and that is really uh, good news to have your support in, in, in that way. Um, I'll finish with the other good news. The other good news is I'm not asking for any money, okay? I don't get any money, you don't give me any money. So, so let's just get that one clear. But I get people working harder, faster, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, and extending their, their gaze to include older people. So if I say to a cafe owner, and I'm thinking of one in particular, good coffee, but there's not an armchair in the coffee bar on the chair. And so I do, I'm not an actor, but I act as though I'm going to fall off. And I say to the person in Hamilton East, if I fall over, uh, the health and safety regulations will not like you very much. Now, that's a bullying technique, and I don't try to do that. But, but um, what we are trying to do is two purposes. One is to raise people's awareness to the increasing number of older people we have here. You'll remember the, the figure, 19,005 now. Um, but secondly, what can we do better for those people? And just generally respecting older people. We have here a 90-year-old. Now, that's fantastic, who has taken the time to make a submission. She's probably paid more rates than a lot of us. But good on her for coming today, OK? And so my final question to you, or request, is written in the report. And that is, this report uh, will finish next year. And the question is, what would the council, hopefully still supporting us, um, and also so does the World Health Organization, uh, what's, what sort of plan would the, this council like from here on? Is it, for example, more of the same? Or is it in conjunction with another existing group, the Waikato plan comes to mind, or the wellbeing project comes to mind, and there might be other ones as well. We could do both. Or nothing, because the Hamilton City Council takes it over completely. Could be tough with some of the organisations that we're dealing with. Um, but we would like a little bit of steer on that. And so um, the next time we turn up, 
we would like to have had a discussion on where we might go from now. So what I would like, please, is for you to think about where we might go, as well as um, what we have done now. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Peggy. Um, we'll open it up for questions from members. Uh, I'll ask that first one to kick things on. Dan Peggy, around uh, COVID, it's been a stressful time for everybody. Um, how's that been going with the aged community? Around the what? Uh, COVID, the... Oh, 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 yes, the lockdown. Yes, the, the lockdown, lockdown. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, well, um, we asked for um, uh, comments from our group. Many of them are retired uh, themselves. I'm trying to. Uh, and, and one of the, the things that, that most everybody mentioned was transport. Uh, but I have to thank you because, as I understand it, the mobility during the lockdown, the mobility uh, discount, or whatever you call it, was increased from $15 to 30 which allowed persons who are eligible for it to get to the hospital. Uh, and, and, and people would like to thank you for that. Um, I think um, the work on, on footpaths, which I already suggested, um, was very much appreciated because a lot of people, not only older people, but everybody, universal design, here you go. You thought you were just doing it for older people, but it was for everybody. And, and that's really good. Uh, the one that we are pondering, which I'm afraid is probably outside your line, um, is the use of the internet and online shopping and online uh, groceries and so on. But we're dealing with it, we're working with it, um, age concern. A small one that I would raise, again, um, we don't think about it, but we do, we could do it easily. And that is respect for older people. Some of the older people who had to queue for their shopping because they lived by themselves, they didn't have contact with the student uh, volunteer team, and, and some of them, now let's not exaggerate, uh, but some of them were asked, why are you here? You should be home, that sort of thing. Um, so I think I just use that example as an example of sometimes we don't actually realise that for an older person to be among us or for a disabled younger person to be among us, it takes them a lot more effort than for us and we should just let them go first or let them take longer, OK? Um, Nick, I don't know if you've got some others that we had. No, that's, that's answered my question. Is Thank you, Dave Biggie. Yep, that's cool. absolutely. It's good. You did well. Um, I saw um, Councillor Thompson's eyes light up and she leaned towards the screen when you said the word transport. So she's got a question coming shortly by Zoom. But Councillor Pascoe um, was in the queue first. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thanks, Dave. Thank Peggy, for you and your committee and the work yes, that you thank do. You. Uh, in asking my question, I will declare um, a conflict of interest in terms of being part of a group of seniors of the city rather than an old person. Uh, but um, um, uh, is council responding fast enough to the priorities that are identified back to your group, particularly in regard to infrastructure? And I know that you've talked about the footpaths and, uh, and, the, and the bus stops and so forth. Um. Well, you have to be, I mean, you people uh, have to be realistic in, in the amount of money and so on you spend on wherever. Um, but I think it's not only uh, what you are spending your money on, but how um, you're dealing with older people themselves. Uh, for example, one of the things that I would ask from the Hamilton City Council is not only, and obviously, your continued backing, but your active backing in, for example, mentioning the older people in your speeches. Um, also, the fact that uh, Hamilton is the first uh, city in New Zealand to be given, to be recognised by the World Health Organisation as having a plan. Now, that happened, what, two years ago? And, and OK, it's on your website, but I've hardly ever seen it mentioned. And yet, ironically, I get asked by people as far away as Wanaka and Taupo and so on and so forth to come and give a day's workshop on how we did it. And it's the same thing as New Zealanders. They don't skite about it in their own home, but the internationals know about our Olympic record um, more than the next-door neighbour. I think the Hamilton City Council and the people of, uh, on my group and others have done very well 
uh, to have this plan and to be implementing it, I would like the council to talk about it a bit more. Not the actual, we did it, but what is being done. And that, I think, would be really, really good. There is a logo from the Office for Seniors, which I have asked about a year ago um, to be put on perhaps the letterhead. It is an achievement of the city to be judged by an international organisation uh, as the, uh, an age-friendly city. Thank you, uh, Dan Piggy. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dan Piggy. Thank you. Now, um, Councillor Thompson's going to ask you a question by Zoom. You'll see her there and hear her behind you. So, <laughs> good luck. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Dane, Peggy and, and Nick. A couple of questions. The first one's just following on from um, this conversation around, I guess, talking yes, about sir. the plan more. Um, I hadn't actually heard very much about it um, until recently myself. And I wondered, do you think um, that it would be beneficial in terms of getting more um, traction behind the plan to give it greater prominence, and how do you think it could be given greater prominence? Uh, greater prominence... What's the word I want? So, greater so pro more, prominence... Um, uh, given more attention in, in council or um, highlighted more... Uh, so it has more prominence in terms of our business as you, way that we do business as usual. Uh, last year, we set up for the first time in the business awards uh, an award for accessibility. Uh, the uh, company Ruby, who won that, um, got a bit of publicity. But that would have been a wonderful opportunity to talk about the fact that here in Hamilton, among the business awards, we have one on accessibility, which particularly is aimed at older people and the disabled. And I also think, as I said before, um, just simply in, in speeches in the 10-year plan, I would expect that. I would expect the new theatre to be thought of older people about. Uh, what about the train that's going to go from Hamilton to Auckland? Is that suitable for people who are disabled? Uh, and, and to actually show some places like that, that, that it would be um, appropriate. And the pools. And the pools. Okay. Well, the pools... Um, Thank you for the prompt from the gallery. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other question was around accessibility, particularly in terms of our transport infrastructure and accessibility of, of buildings and things. Um, we had a really good discussion in regard to transport accessibility in the pre um, last infrastructure uh, operations meeting. And do you think it would, um, this is possibly to staff as well, uh, be beneficial to have some joint up thinking or program in terms of um, accessibility? Uh, when we, because the discussion in the infrastructure meeting was around um, the disability action plan and how um, we can support that in terms of that infrastructure. But obviously, you know, there's, um, uh, a, a close link here in, in terms of those needs around accessibility. Um, I'm, I'm torn between answering that question in detail because it is one that requires that and uh, looking at it slightly more strategically, which I'll choose given time. Um, it, I would suggest that the 10-year plan has a ruler uh, over it with respect to is this appropriate or suitable or adjusted to older people? Uh, I've made that suggestion before. I haven't succeeded in getting it, but the words universal design should appear in your 10-year plan and the word accessibility. But the universal design is really a technical word that I think this council should use a lot more often. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Sarah. There being uh, no more questions, uh, the motion is on the table. Um, the idea is that we, we are here to receive this update report, um, and we're going to ask staff to go away and do some more work um, by the end of this year, with a mind to reviewing the age-friendly plan next year. Uh, we'll move into debate. Um, as the mover. Um, I'll just, uh, just want to say a very, uh, very quick thank you to uh, Dame Peggy. I've really enjoyed our interaction so far and looking forward to some, some great sparking of ideas once we get started <laughs> together. We're, we're trouble. Um, 
I also want to pay respect to the council before last for, uh, for setting this up because um, we found ourselves in a position where we're the youngest city in the country uh, with the most progressive age-friendly plan in the yes. city. So great work, really well done. Um, and it's been a pleasure to, to do this. Dame Peggy, thank you for uh, not asking for any money, um, but your, your, um, your suggestions are really pragmatic and <laughs> taken on board about, let's mention this in our speeches, let's sing this uh, from the hilltops, because um, the more we talk about it, the more people want to be involved. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Councillor Gallagher. Yes, I just want to acknowledge uh, Dame Peggy's team and the people around her for the intellectual grunt yeah. uh, that they bring. And there's been comment that we don't have um, <clears throat> advisory groups, consultation groups, but certainly with regard to the senior, senior or elders of the city, we do. It's independent, it's fearless, uh, and I think that's really important mm, that you, it Martin. can tell council, uh, you know, what it may not want to hear. And I know that my two old, the colleagues who are older in this council, that's Councillor Pascoe and Councillor McPherson, are very comforted ah, by you, the Martin. work of, of Dame Peggy's. Uh, um, we'll committee, together. it doesn't, of course, you know, obviously, it'll well, be some time day. before I'm in their category. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Thompson? Excellent. Or was that just a blue? Um, I'm OK. Thank you. All right. You... I was just my hand up. Yep, no, that happens. That's all good. All right. Well, right of reply. Thank you very much. Oh, you had a... Uh... Oh, yeah, Councillor McPherson. There we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's my right of reply to <laughs> Councillor Gallagher. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I'm, I'm in awe of the achievements of my two co older colleagues on, the, on either side of me here, but I, I actually think we're after a slightly um, contentious start. This plan has been excellent for the city, and I think, um, Peggy, Dame Peggy, you made an important point about uh, the disability access issues yep. being related to this, and I can, can assure you that the train has certainly taken that into account, okay. as has our new uh, station at yeah. Rosakari. Yeah, in fact, um, we've uh, required the uh, toilets and uh, other yeah. facilities out there to be um, have enhanced design to take account of that, and in fact, the new new transport hub out there is going to be somewhat of a template for future transport hubs in terms of its accessibility issues, full accessibility, not the halfway house that um, happens in some places. But um, I think we could perhaps do more work in terms of consultation, not just with the disability community, Mr Chair, but also with the, um, uh, the people working on the age-friendly plan and other groups like... Um, the two that uh, Dame Peggy mentioned before, so I think I think this is a good move, um, and the, I'd like to say that the biggest development since the plan was endorsed in February 2018 was the was my birthday and eligibility for the pension one month after that. Oh, you only got it because of us. No? Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, there being no other speakers, I'll, look, I'll just say again, thank you very much, um, uh, committee. That the theme of today of so far, what we've seen is that we've done well. Uh, we can always do better. So I'm looking forward to some exciting new work as we as we progress this along. Okay, thank you, Dame Peggy. Uh, so all those in favour, uh, show of hands, please. Say aye. Receive the port. Any against? Carried. Carried unanimously. Thank you, Dame Peggy. It's good to see you again. Thank you, Nick, for all your great work. Cheers. Okay, we'll move on to item five now, which is on page uh, six of your governance, which is the confirmation of the minutes of 19th of May. Now, that was by Zoom. Question of clarification. Absolutely, yes. Uh, item seven, I just want to clarify, uh, which I obviously dissented, a horrendous recommendation that you look at the privatisation of part of Memorial Park. Is that, uh, just could Lance help me here, I take it, number one, that would be um, a rec would have to be a recommendation to full council, and would the report include consultation with the Return Service Association with regard to that proposal? Okay, I was pretty close, Martin, but we'll get Lance to. Uh, can I answer the second bit first because it's easiest? Um, yes, uh, to the consultation. So um, we're looking at an open process and talking to stakeholders and and the community. Um, I'm just trying to recall what we passed in the annual plan meeting uh, last week to go out to public consultation. There was a sum of money for some work, um, which then 
uh, we have to bring that work back to council. So um, the business case, I'll, I'll probably have to ask um, Becca to give some advice on whether or not this recommendation needs to go to council. Recommendation. All right. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Okay. So, Martin, do you mind if we get back to you with the answer? Yeah. No. No. I'm not. I'm not disputing the record of that horrendous mm. motion, but obviously, <laughs> I just wanted to clarify <laughs> around delegation yeah. and yep. uh, consultation. Certainly, don't intend to debate it at this meeting. No. So I, I would have thought a business case. Um, we're not actually um, giving a, a, an interest in any of those properties to anything at this time, it's just a business case, so I, I would see that this the committee delegations would probably cover it, but so I'll take, take the governance manager's sure, advice no, no, on that, that. that's fine. All right, thank you, Martin. Thank um, you. Item five, confirmation of the committee uh, minutes oh, of 19th of May. I'll move no, to no, the no. seconder oh, yeah. of those minutes. Okay, uh, Councillor Nadi Roof, um, any questions on the minutes of the previous meeting? Martin, is your button just left on from last time? No, or? no, sorry, apologies. Yeah, no. Okay, there being no questions, uh, move to debate. No debate, okay. Um, moved and seconded. And those in favour, show of hands, please. Thank you very much. Councillor Angela, are you in? No. You? <laughs> Rotter. Okay, and those against? Carried. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Council. Um, let me see. All right, we're aiming to take a break. Um, fairly shortly. Would you prefer to, we can whip into now, we can go into either community and social development out outcomes item nine, I'm just thinking for expediency of time, or would you prefer to take a break now? A cup of tea? Oh, actually, i tell you what, we'll whip through the chair's report just before we go any further. Um, chair's report, sorry to make you jump around diligent, that's on page 74, so we'll go uh, 78, no, where is? Where is 82. 82. Do I have any advances on 82? Do I hear 83? Okay. 82. The Chair's report, yep, I've tried to keep it as van vanilla as I possibly can. Um, do we have, I'll move that the report be received. Do I have any questions? I'll take it as read. Chair's report. Councillor Gallagher. I think that's, it's very appropriate, uh, your comment of, of thanks for our Deputy Chair and uh, yeah. uh, Ollie and Tipura for they their have assistance. Been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. That's, that's, um, that's appreciated. Um, any other questions? Any debate? Yeah, that's how you do a Chair's report. Okay, those in favour, say aye. Those, oi. Those in favour, say aye. Thank you. Those against? Yeah, whatever. Uh, those against, uh, carried unanimously. Thank you. All right, um, look, we'll take a break now. It's close enough to quarter past. We'll come back at half past 11 um, for our next exciting session of Community Committee 2020. Thank you.
Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on to item uh, the community occupancy applications, item number six. This is on page 11 of your diligent. And there are three things we're dealing with here. And welcome to uh, on 11. Welcome to Karen Kwok. Fantastic. You want to thank you? recommendations. Happy to second that, unless anyone else wants to. Um, all right. Okay. Yep. That's all yours. So, good morning, Mayor and Councillors. Um, today's community occupancy report is uh, seeking approval of three new leases for existing groups, so they're renewals for Gordlands Rovers Sports Club, the Hamilton Astronomical Society, and the Waikato Society of Potters. Happy to take any questions that you've got. All right, uh, Councillor Hamilton. Thanks. Just when you're finished, when you're ready. So I'm looking for Alt A to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks, Karen. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a couple of questions. With the Rovers, I know 15 years. Remind me again, have we got the levers inside our policy that we can we can shorten the term if there's a shift in council policy or um, geography around the area, that sort of thing? We're not bound to the whole... We, we are bound once we've... Um, signed off for a lease, that's the term that we're giving that group. So if the policy does change, then it's only for those leases going forward. So we do have some historical leases that are um, longer terms. You, typically, they used to be 20 years. Um, OK, so for example, with um, the Society of Potters, um, there's a reference in the resolution to adjustments that we can make around the Western Town Belt, but in the proposed staff recommendation and now the motion, it doesn't acknowledge that. So I'm just, help, can you give me any comfort around our flexibility should the Western Town Belt, we want to track something, we're not bound into that term? So in the actual lease documents, there's always a optional termination clause for council, should we um, have see that there's a better use for that space. So every lease has got, I guess, an out clause for council anyway. Um, but I, if there is a particular management plan or um, something that, that may impact on a lease in the future, we always like to put in a special condition to make it crystal clear to that group that there is um, plans that may impact them in the future or to make it clear that council has the option to terminate the lease should they need to. So that's sort of my first question. We have got levers to pull should we need to. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. I think, and Councillor Ryan, are you asking in section 45, it talks about putting in a special condition clause because the West Town Belt Master Plan. Yeah. Are you saying in the recommendation that we should um, have that explicitly in there so it's clear for the potters? Well, um, yeah, I don't necessarily want to get hung up on it, but I, I don't have that assurance um, that it is in there, other than if, unless it's, <laughs> unless you can give me that assurance that it is, because um, like I don't have visibility to what that term is. Yeah. <clears throat> but Karen, I think you're, what you're saying is, in our leases, there's a, a general term. So if Chris Allen wants to put a sewerage pipe across the Cordlands football field or something, we can, we can alter things because of. A public work or whatever, you know, whatever. Um, but I think what Councillor Ryan's asking is in the Potters one with the West Town Belt Master Plan. Um, what it seems to be suggesting in the report that we have a specific special condition in there because of what might come out of some of those indicative projects that are in that plan. Yeah, and so, if I, if I so could... the question is, do we need the specific clause or, or will the general general one? cover that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, and, and Chair, if I could, just for context, we've got the um, Hamilton, we've got the Ward Street property redeveloping, and we're talking about pedestrian access way on that corner uh, across from Girls High, and I just don't want to make sure that we're bound into a position where we've got that blockaded 
Potter because that was that came up as quite a yeah a blocked corner. Yeah. So I just want to know that we've got flexibility around it. That's all. Karen, can you provide that assurance? special clause into their actual lease document around the West Town Belt Management Plan and that allows council to uh, terminate the lease um, with, with notice to the group should we need to. I mean, if it makes you more comfortable, we can add it to the resolution around inserting that special condition. Add it if, if Councillor Ryan feels... Is that specific? <laughs> So yeah, and I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even want to limit it to the Western Town Belt. Yeah, I mean, a, a chair of um, CBD Advisory may have a view, but just just to give us flex, if there's any shift in that, and it could be for pedestrians, cycleways, anything, it just gives us a bit of scope, a bit of latitude. That's all. Yeah. Okay. So, can we? Is there some wording of a resolution that you'd like that can give you that assurance? Are you quite happy with them to? Um, I think start? maybe if we can reference something. I don't need the detail of it, but just. At a high level, um, maybe a, a Roman numerals four saying something like, and with the addition of a special uh, um, clause as outlined in section uh, forty-five of the report. Yeah, but not just limited to Western Town Belt. It could be other CBD yeah. related activity. Oh, okay. All right. Um, a special clause which allows council to. And I'm just trying to find the wording. That Karen had in the report. Um, you can have a play with it anyway if there's other questions or whatever. Yep. Yeah, okay. okay. Thanks, uh, Ryan. Thank okay. you. Any other questions at the moment? Okay, we'll, we'll with your, um, leave you and we'll talk around with the words and run that by you. Uh, Councillor McPherson. Yes, thanks. I'm not sure actually I agree with that, with the, the potters being sing singled out, because with any um, community occupancy lease there could be future issues uh, and there I, I know from personal experience there is always a clause in your lease saying council's got the right with notice to, to terminate it for good reasons sort of thing and I know that's that's always that's in our policy if I yep. if I remember it, right there somewhere so I sort of think it's covered but it, and it's better that it's covered generically rather than sort of I think it might potentially cause, give them a bit of cause for concern if they're singled out by the motion, if you get what I mean. Yep. I, I don't disagree with the intent, yep. but provided it's everyone doing that. But that wasn't my question. I was just um, was saying you might be thing? using a sledgehammer there to crack a walnut. Um, but um, Karen, and this question was definitely asked last time it came up, why are some leases 15 years and some 10 um, what's the difference? Because uh, where I'm coming from is if you, they all involve buildings, and if you're looking at upgrading or replacing buildings, um, you want some surety of tenure as much as can be given on public land. Uh, so I'm not sure why they're different lengths. We used to sort of have a standard of 20 years, like you said, um, for many years we gave out 20 years except unless it was by exception and I think you can go up to 30 in the act or something close to that so I'm not sure why we're doing 10s and 15s now and why there's why they're different so that was part of the policy when it was first put in place is those around the different terms so the 15 years is for groups that own their own building so it gives okay. them a long longer tenure in recognition that they actually own the building on council land. Um, where it's a council building on council land, that's where it's a 10-year lease term because it's council's building. So that gives us, in recognition that it's council's building, gives us more flexibility in terms of that, or in terms of the term. There seem to be some, um, some exclusions to that then in terms of owning buildings that I, I might have to take that up with staff later because um, I don't want to discuss an individual case here, um, for instance. But so uh, We're happy to talk to you offline about that, Councillor yeah. Dave. Um, Why are we... Uh, so you're saying the policy requires that 15 or 10, even though the law could allow us to have up to 30? Correct. Now, that was in the policy, but remembering that by resolution, Council can pass... Anything else so over, if a, over the top of the policy? I'm trying to, if a um, community organisation wants to put a new building, Koti Pacifica, for example, on the site, we could d 
to give them a 30-year lease to say, yeah, it's worth raising the money to build a building on it. Correct. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's and, and, and if it's an extraordinary situation like that, then um, we would probably recommend to council to do that. Okay. Yep. No, that's good. The, the, the last one was the... Um, the potters situation, not so much them, but there's a precinct of similar uh, groups down there, um, and there is some has been some discussion about a enhanced sort of community arts centre on that that precinct is the best way of talking. Do, will this list, uh, the, sorry, this lease get in the way of that sort of discussion? Because they obviously they're all going to have different leases in different periods. So I think the overriding clause in all our leases is that should council have a good reason um, to terminate the lease, we can. Um, and it's not something that I'm aware of council has done or made a habit of doing, um, <laughs> but it is there in every lease clause. I'm thinking more the other direction if all the groups that are down there with different lease periods and that got together and said, hey, here's our proposal to council's long-term plan in year six or seven, we want a community arts facility <laughs> with rooms for all the different activities. Um, we want to change the lease. Um, can they make that approach? Yeah, yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. staff would work with them to facilitate that because hubbing and better use of um, resources is something that you know we definitely want to do and it's reflected in our policy so yes which might then speak to uh, Ryan's point about whether you can design to open up the corner rather than being closed like it is now absolutely so all those groups are, are actually aware of the West Town Belt Master Plan that we will be having further conversations okay. as time goes on so and, I, and, I, and you're absolutely right we'll get everyone around the table and actually thrash it out cool thank you thanks Cool. Thank you. And uh, I believe that with that resolution now, you're quite satisfied that you're not satisfied? <laughs> OK. All right. We'll go through further questions in the meantime. Uh, Councillor Pascoe. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm just looking for some clarification around the Potters one. When I read paragraph 45, it seems to me that your intent is to include that special condition. So does that make Councillor Ryan's suggestion of adding that specifically into the motion um, redundant, if that is already going to be included in the in the in the ten-year lease agreement. So I think Karen mentioned before, there's the standard lease clause which enables us to terminate the lease at any point in time. What Karen and the staff were attempting to do in putting that extra clause in, because the West Town Belt is a known potential yep. impact on them, is making it crystal clear to them that that is one thing that we know today that could impact the lease term. So it was an attempt by staff to make things clear for the group so that if we did find ourselves in a situation where we were driving a redevelopment of that site in accordance with the West Town Belt, then it was well documented and known. Um, so it was a protection mm -hmm. clause attempt by staff, but in a technical sense, not needed because of the other lease clause, which is a blanket lease clause. Yeah. So it's not just restricted to the to the uh, Western Town West Town Belt master master plan. It could be for any any good reason that council had. Yeah. But as I said, that's yeah. the one where we yeah. know we've got a master yeah. plan. We yeah. know it potentially could impact on the tenants in that space. Okay. So just asking the general manager, is it, is it necessary then for Councillor Ryan's um, amended uh, amendment? I'm not sure whether there is an amendment or a change to the motion if this is already specifically going to be included and presumably you've got agreement with the Potters group that that clause is going to be in the 10-year renewal of their lease. Okay. I, I'm happy to add in a four where we actually explicitly put in the recommendation but from what I'm hearing from Karen is that the other clause would cover it anyway and they are aware of Council's intentions going forward. But doesn't paragraph 45 say that, that there's going yeah. to be a specific it does. clause yeah. over and above the catch-all clause? But I clause. think what yeah. Councillor Ryan was saying, it's not captured in the recommendation. Oh, I see. Oh, OK, OK. It's, yeah. okay. it's in the report, but it's not in the recommendation. That's what he was querying. OK. So my, my last question then, um, the potters are happy with that with that not only with the catch-all clause, but one that specifically refers to the 
town belt master plan? Yes, they're comfortable with it and they also understand that in a standard lease anyway, council has a, yep, a clause. Has, has so that right. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you, councillor. Um, good questions. So, councillor Hamilton, where does that leave us? To maybe talk freely, um, yep. I don't want to get into debate <coughs> or anything. I guess for context, I appreciate that it's it's being acknowledged. I just didn't want to limit it to, and I don't want to make it hard for them, it's just an area of high interest, and it's not just necessarily Western Town Belt, it's, it's the Ward Street redevelopment where we've got on, there's the Northern Districts, which may not be Western Town Belt specific, so I just want to keep it open. And when I look through the seven-page council policy, I don't get that explicit control. I appreciate it might be written into the agreement, but I don't have that in the report in front of me today. That's why I'm pushing on a bit. Okay, so what would you prefer? Well, I'd be interested to see what lights comes up. That's in a standard lease. Would that help? Yeah, it would help. Okay. So, if after giving due consideration to the public <coughs> interest in the reserve or property, the leasor is of the view that the premises or any part of the premises could be better used for any other purpose, the leasor may terminate this lease by not less than six months written notice to the leasee. So that's a catch-all clause that we have in every lease. Okay. Um, I've just found um, with the leases I've dealt with historically, if it is also another clause in the special condition that relates to a potential project, it's much easier to um, negotiate and, and talk to that group about that clause if we need to enact it, because um, often committee members change and if it's nice and clear, then I find at the other end in 10 years' time, it's, um, it's just really transparent and clear with the club if something actually eventuates. So we do have it in other leases where, where there's some project or, or plan for a potential project in the future. Yeah, look, I'm happy for it to be just referenced as a note even to the meeting that you can take on to the agreement, we but just that. not yep. limited to Western Town Belt. It could include yep. biking, micro-ability, CBD regeneration, Northern District, just, yep. you know, so that it's noted. I think your point's made and it will be noted. Councillor Wilson? Thank you. So we'll get a committee mo note made of that? Thanks. Sorry, Councillor Wilson. I've understood staff to say that, in fact, there will be two clauses. <laughs> There will be the general catch-all that gives a general catch-all for whatever reason, and then there's an additional clause that is highlighting a known. So it, it, that's why I felt there was comfort. So, <coughs> but I accept, and I'm happy to put a note relating to the fact, yeah, that okay. I thought this agreement was good because it had right. the two clauses the catch-all for any reason, and then we've known an issue potentially, and we've highlighted that in addition to the catch-all. Yep. So that'll be noted, and the place to check that will be in the minutes in the next meeting. Great. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Van Eusten. Um, yeah, just a question from me, um, and thank you for reading out that clause. It's really helpful to have an understanding about the kind of notice that we would be giving a, um, a community um, asset such as the, um, the Potters Association. Um, I, my question really is um, that, in fear that we wouldn't leave it to the last six months before having that conversation, that if there were um, decisions made from council that impacted on them or any of, of the others, that we would be in early and having conversations and setting up alternative arrangements for them. Um, that's a minimum, is the six months, as per the lease, but we would always um, talk to the group and work with them as early as possible, as soon as we knew anything, um, we'd bring it up with them. So, yeah. my, Councillor Van Neusten, my, my experience of these things, um, get in early, um, be open and honest, um, flag things for the future, and um, generally, you know, we're quite often talking two to three years lead in. Um, so it's a bit like mainly in cheese, good things take time. So, and, but Karen's right. Sometimes you do have people coming and leaving boards and trusts and, you know, that sort of thing. So I think it's about making sure that we keep in regular contact and, and flag things as early as possible, you know, because just giving people six months notice, it, 
you know, it, it's not a good look, but that's just the legal mm. side of it. Uh, from the presentation today, um, it looked like they're a, a thriving um, organisation and uh, with a growing membership and, in, in, you know, a lot of interest from the public. Absolutely, and it's an area, you know, like we, and Councillor Mark would know and Councillor Kish that, you know, we get approached by a number of groups um, as they grow and as new groups form as well. So, you know, it's a discussion we'll have during the LTP. Happy with it, Councillor Max? Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, there'll be no uh, further questions. Uh, I will put the move, uh, the motion, be pardon, and we will put the staff recommendation. Uh, big pardon, Ewan's moved that, big pardon. So Ewan, I will, and I've seconded it, so Ewan, uh, the floor's yours if you wish to debate it, or we can quite simply go straight to the vote. Clubs that engage uh, and enable people to develop a passion, uh, and I think uh, we in local government have an active role in trying to enable that, and that makes for a better society. So whenever, and, and I've matured over my years, I remember looking at these very early on and passionately arguing, why are we giving such a subsidy? Why can't we be more commercial? And boy, am I glad for those 15 years of experience because I now understand it more. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to be part of that enrichment. So that's why I'm happy Thank to move it. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Um, would you like to reply to yourself or uh, you sort it? OK, no, um, no, no other speakers. Thank you very much. We'll put uh, all three of those together. And we'll do this by board, if we could, please. Uh, so Statler and Waldorf over there. Um, Sarah, will, are you at the meeting? Uh, Councillor Thompson has left the meeting. Council, Councillor Thompson's not here for the vote. Okay. Oh, no, she is here for the vote. I'm from this, Mark, because I only just got Okay, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thanks. All right, everybody voted? The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you, team. It was really good, really good. OK, we'll keep an eye on those minutes. Great questions. Um, moving on to the civil defence update. Uh, this will be a verbal report from Kelvin. Uh, this is item number eight, and it's on page 30 of Diligent. Not there's much to read there, but page 30. So, so yours, Kelvin, you have 35 seconds. Good morning, Chair, and good morning, Councillors. Uh, Chair, firstly, thank you for your indulgence in allowing me to uh, make a verbal report today rather than the traditional written report. At the time that the, it came to prepare the report for today, we were still uh, act actively engaged in our uh, COVID response. Um, look, just really want to touch on a, a, a bit of a quick overview of where we've got to. Um, obviously, the 26th of March was the declaration, of the national de declaration of emergency. We activated our emergency operations centre at, at, uh, over at uh, the Genesis building. It was a little different this time, and we operated in conjunction with Waikato District on a shared facility, which we uh, ran throughout uh, alert level four and three. Once we moved to alert level two, we actually expanded the area and we were, we were doing it for Thames Coromandel, Matamata Piako, uh, Hauraki, Waikato District and Hamilton. Um, and then on the 2nd of June, uh, we closed down the facility. We have still continuing today to provide uh, financial support to food banks up until the 30th of June, in which case it transitions to Ministry of Social Development. And we're also monitoring and providing ongoing financial support to foreign nationals uh, until the end of the month, at which time uh, that will then transition to the Department of Internal Affairs. Um, we operated in total for 69 days. We had 62 uh, Hamilton City Council staff who were involved in the, the, the response. We operated, for other than the last th three weeks, we operated the first seven weeks on seven days a week uh, and had a welfare helpline which operated from 7am to 7pm 
each day of the week. Uh, we were effectively a provider of, I say, of last resort. We were, if, if people were not connected to a provider with another government agency and they were without food or accommodation uh, in particular, that fell to civil defence to, uh, in fact, uh, support those people until such time as we could then align them with a, another provider who could take over a longer term uh, process around that. Um, if we look at our costs for running the operation, excluding obviously staff salaries, 1.6 million on emergency food, food bank support and emergency accommodation. Um, and there was a small bit on food support for animals. Um, our initial actions were focused on the immediate food demand through vouchers and shopping for vulnerable people. And at that stage, the structures and systems weren't in place, so it was pretty helter-skelter right at the very start when we first went into Alert Level 4. Uh, that transitioned um, then to being able to provide ongoing support and assistance that was for accommodation, feeding and clothing people, psychological support and support for their companion animals, and the provision of emergency accommodation for those who were unable to stay in their usual place of residence um, or had no means of self-isolating during alert levels four and three. Um, in those early days, we did um, 240 uh, deliveries of household goods, which was everything from supermarket vouchers, emergency food parcels and blankets. Uh, we took 1,600 calls on the emergency helpline for people requesting support and assistance. Uh, we provided 201 nights accommodation for people who were with nowhere to stay. Uh, and then, say, the we spent 1.2 million on supporting food banks and uh, the pre preparation of uh, frozen meals and or here to help support who were able to and, and then support across the wider community. Um, that looks like 84,000 individuals who were served meals, uh, either through food parcels or frozen meals. They were averaging um, through the here to help 885 uh, meals per day, frozen meals per day that were going out, 145 food parcels a day, uh, and a further 6,500 meals that went out of Hamilton into the wider Waikato region. I guess in terms of some context around that, this is the second only national uh, declaration of emergency we've ever had in New Zealand, the first being the Christchurch earthquake that this was different in that it affected every part of New Zealand simultaneously. Um, it's only the second ever time that we can find that Hamilton has activated, the first being obviously for Fakari White Island just before Christmas. Uh, and it was the longevity of, or the expected longevity of this we were setting up to um, be prepared to respond through to at least Christmas of this year, which was some of the initial um, projections of what the impact was going to be. Uh, the fact that we've got on top of it signif significantly sooner uh, says an immense amount about the um, If we look back on what we've achieved, there's a whole heap of positives and there's some learnings or challenges we're going to look at as we go away from here. First one was our ability to um, significantly meet the immediate needs of our communities. Um, we've tackled a whole heap of vulnerability in a fresh and different way. And when I say we, it's not just civil defence. Um, I think Hamilton has done something quite sp spectacular and special in the cumulative response. I think it's a template that others I know are looking at of how a community as Hamilton Inc. came together, made up of concerned citizens and NGOs and the council and civil defence and, uh, and using council facilities such a, 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 as we did with Claudelands and using staffing over there who were redirected, 
we, and using obviously a, a, a provider like Montana, we did something really, really special. And I think of all the things that we've done, the thing to be most proud of, I think, is we look back and you see the impact you had on vulnerable people across our community. Uh, and so that was something we look at. I think we showed that we could be flexible and adaptable because, I mean, the, the goalposts kept changing and we had to keep uh, reinventing ourselves. Um, we gave a lot of people in Hamilton, some Hamilton City Council, some experience in a real live civil defence event. One of the issues that we previously suffered from was uh, a lack of experience uh, of, of our staff in dealing with real events. So this is an opportunity for us to have actually um, given people a great deal of, of confidence and experience. And so I would like to be able to say that we can say with a good degree of uh, clarity for Council that you should have some confidence now when and if we have our next event in Hamilton of some disaster or emergency, you should have confidence that we can uh, mobilise and have a professional response. I think one of the things that came out of it was some relationship stuff. We did working cross councils. We started doing it with two and ended up with five councils. That was something unique and different. Um, I think one of the things that we did get some success of was during the duration of this, we developed our Po Arahi response with having uh, cultural representation, representing Waikato Tainui, Mata Waka and uh, our mana whenua groups being present, being there, able to um, provide advice and, and put a Māori lens over everything that we're doing in civil defence, which was, I know, is now being looked at by other parts of the region as being something that they're, they're looking to potentially try and replicate. OK, thank you, Kelvin. I think we'll draw it to close. OK. And uh, anything else we'll eke out through questions, if we may. Um, but uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll move that we receive the verbal report, first of all. Do I have a seconder? Uh, thank you, Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Taylor. Uh, Councillor O'Leary, you had some questions? Yes, just a question, actually. Um, Calvin, the, the budget items that you met, that you mentioned in your verbal report, what, that's, is that all budget that, was, that came from our 12-point recovery and response plan? No. This is $1.6 <coughs> million dollars which was spent in the response, which we've now subsequently in the process of making uh, reimbursement applications to the government, to the National Emergency Management Agency in Wellington for reimbursement of those costs. OK, that's new. Does that no. make it clear? Or is it well, yeah, it is, but I just... Um, I, that's new information. I didn't realise we were so... On top of the... The the twelve point plan. We also spent what was it one point six million through civil. Is that a hundred percent reimbursed by government? Uh, my expectation is that all bar fifty thousand of that one point six will be reimbursable. Okay, so as well as the, the uh, facility that was at Claudelands, making all the meals that we contributed along with other um, NGOs. You were, our civil defence in its capacity was also providing food vouchers and... And we were also funding some, um, Here to Help over at Claudelands, Claudelands. as well, to this, about 135000 a week. OK. Um, I, didn't think our, I didn't think our civil defence budget had that much money in it. Can we get a report? I'm just interested in mm -hmm. how... And just to follow along when that, you know, that government refund comes to us, I'd, I'd be interested. Maybe that comes through Rob's committee? Yeah, it should go to finance. So. Yeah. Absolutely. So that'll be an over-expenditure and then a recovery. And then so. a recovery, yeah. Yep. But just yep. so we've got a line item yep. so, so we track I'll, it. I'll just yep. get the governance team to make a note of that and then we can make sure that's reported yep. to finance. Great. Thank yep. you. Good Thanks. questions. Thank you, Councillor Angela. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, a couple of quick questions. This is such an important um, topic. Um, firstly, Calvin, well done. You're certainly a steady hand during this crisis, so I acknowledge the work you've done. But just a couple of questions to sort of take, go back to the, the, the nitty-gritty. Um, not wanting to waste a good crisis, and you touched on some of the gaps, you know, experience for your staff, um, relationships with other councils. Were there other key things that you learnt through this that we as an organisation can improve and need to improve on? Things that probably more that civil defence in our 
operation needed. We, we spent a, an awful lot of time um, focusing on technical competencies associated with the respective parts of civil defence. One of the some of the stuff that we could have done better ahead of time was to have developed wider cross-agency relationships with some of the other government departments. Uh, I think some of that was an area that we need to strengthen. Uh, I think our reach and touch with, for example, Cote Pacifica and some of the other, you know, the, the Runanga who were out doing their own work and we were just a little bit uh, removed from their reporting. So there's some stuff around the community engagement componentry I think we need to work on. And you'll, I'll assume that you'll continue to build on that now that you've got that momentum. Absolutely. Thanks. The other quick question was, um, previously you used to do sort of like a traffic light report and appreciate you couldn't present that today. I, I, and and we, we had some quite big shortfalls on that in terms of where, where we should be. Is that still a project you're working on or you, you talked about you sort of moved on from that sort of analysis? That, 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 that's our yearly work plan. Uh, I think you'll appreciate the yearly work plan got suspended uh, when we've been doing this full time for the last three months. But yes, there is still a yearly work plan. We've just revisited it again uh, with a view to refreshing that. And when I come back with a written report, I'll have a, a refreshed update of that. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Thank Chair. you, Ryan. Um, Mangai Tua. Thanks, uh, Chair. Yeah, and um, Calvin, just um, support uh, Councillor Hamilton's points on your leadership during the crisis. I was on there a couple of times. and. Uh, Looked like it was a very steady ship, I think. Um, good innovative way of collapsing down um, the EOCs um, to sustain the workforce. Just on that, how sustainable would it have been if you were to carry on for a protracted length of time with your workforce there? I think we, what we were doing, and to, when we were doing it across the five councils, all the councils were, were, were contributing staff, I think that was very sustainable for a long-term period, which was the rationale for why it was going to be put in place to start with. The, the, it wasn't believed that any one council would sustain on their own a long-term response. Great. And um, my final question is, um, this is, this report is coming in a written form at some stage for this committee, because I think it's um, really important to capture what happened and also the lessons learned and um, opportunities for improvement going forward. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Maungai. Uh, Councillor Nadi Ralph. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, Calvin, just um, uh, reflecting on the number of people that were helped during this crisis, um, was there any effort to maintain some sort of database of who was being helped and any sort of plan around the continuation of that Provision. We have a database of, of all of the calls that we received, what their requests for service were, and how we dealt with those from a civil defence perspective. But as I said at the start, our, our role was to provide the immediate or the last resort uh, intervention with a view to do the immediacy part, which was often overnight or over a weekend, with a view to then aligning that person or that family with a long-term service provider who could take that going forward. So ours were very short-term. Um, three days would potentially be the longest we'd be looking to, to, to be supporting someone before they would, went to Ministry of Business and, and Innovation or whether it was Ministry of Social Development or whoever the appropriate agency was. So was that handover done? There was a handover done okay. with them, yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Keish. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, uh, Chair Mark. Calvin, my question is relating to costs. Uh, in addition to the 1.6 million, which we are hoping to get a refund of all but 50,000, uh, have you sat about and tried to identify the cost of staff time that has been taken away from their normal job? And were there any additional costs that we had to incur to, to attract uh, um, temporary staff to fill urgent jobs that the staff that have been allocated to civil defence couldn't do? The, to answer the last part of your question, no. 
I'm not aware of anyone who had to employ anyone on a part. Bearing in mind that this happened obviously during, started at level four and yeah. three, in which case <clears throat> during that we were in pretty much a lockdown situation and work as you might describe it was very different <coughs> and, and very patchy. A number of the people we had working for us were from roles where they would not have been able to operate in their core business under alert four or three. Um, have I, I haven't done any research to determine what the total would be, but it is accepted in civil defence that uh, staff salaries, wages are, are, not re are not recoverable and is the contribution from each council. So I haven't taken that any That's further. Great. But thank you for that. But in the report that you prepare for Angela, Councillor Angela, in regards to ensuring we get the money back, uh, would it not be... Uh, maybe this is a question to the Chief Executive, maybe it, wouldn't it not be sensible to at least try to identify what that cost is to the organisation? Um, just so that we know that, you know, um, as a result of COVID, um, we redeployed staff and it was at a cost of $500,000 that we take on the chin, but you're yep. explaining that to our rate path. I, actually, I think there's value, and I think it will more come from the learnings post-COVID as well in terms of my reallocation of staff in general, in terms of you know what staff were doing their main job, what staff were doing someone else's job, what staff were doing uh, civil defence work, and also what staff were effectively um, neutralised as a consequence of COVID and they couldn't do their job at all as part of the communication story behind COVID. And that will then help us also form our uh, resource allocation models going forward to make sure we're actually well resourced if this event, which I'm sure they will, shows up again to make sure we've actually got the right people, the right place at the right time. Exactly. For that reason, I think, yep. and that's where you're going. Yep. yep. Good suggestion. Good suggestion. Any more questions, Councillor Wilson? Uh, no, no, that wasn't. Thank you. Okay. Well, look, I've uh, I have moved the uh, the council receive or the committee of big fan receives the um, the verbal report uh, seconded by Deputy Mayor Taylor. Um, is there any debate, Councillor? I'll, I'll wait till the end, Councillor O'Leary. So you, you go ahead. This is the first formal meeting we've had civil defence present. Since lockdown, I just wanted to thank Calvin and the team. Um, we have come a really, really long way with our civil defence in the bigger picture from many, many years ago. Um, Calvin inherited, uh, yeah, n not a great space, I guess. And um, I really appreciate the comment that you made today, Calvin, around the uh, staff and team actually having... Um, even though, you know, uh, having a pandemic's not, certainly not a great thing. We've got to look at what opportunities that we, we have. So I appreciate you making that comment that now the staff um, or the team have had some hands-on experience and it's good to hear that everything probably went, or obviously went really well. So if you can pass on certainly my um, thanks and congratulations to them. It's Thank good you. to know. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other speakers or...? No? OK, well, I'll, I'll wrap up and, uh, and endorse Councillor O'Leary's comments. Um, it's, uh, as I said in the Chair's report, I'm incredibly proud of the way our services, you know, civil defence, community groups, etc., really barred up and, uh, and, and steered down this immediate crisis. Um, you know, we know this isn't over yet, and we just move on to another phase, but the civil defence kicked in when they were needed. And, um, and as you can see, Mayor Paul is away um, with rightful bragging rights about how our city... Uh, raise the bar when it came to emergency response. So thank you for that. I'm looking forward to um, a written report next time. Uh, as they say, um, sorry I wrote such a, a long story, didn't have time to write a short one. So I'll look forward to, uh, to you having more time to, to write a report for us next time. Um, and thank you, councillors and uh, committee, for your support of civil defence as we go. So no other speakers. So we shall move to the vote. We'll do this by a show of hands. Um, <coughs> Councillor Thompson, are you, oh, you're there. Good, great. So, uh, so we'll, all those in favour that we receive your report and against, carried unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, right, thanks Calvin. Um, right, where to next? The community and social outcomes, I think. Yep. Yes, okay.
All right. Um, so in place of Andy, we have Helen for item number nine, which is the Community and Social Development ELCA Outcomes uh, on page 31. Just a reminder, we're aiming to head for lunch at uh, one o'clock and we'll be back at 1.45 for this That's afternoon's right. programme. So it's over to you, Helen. Kia ora koutou. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and elected members. Um, unfortunately, Andy isn't able to make the meeting today, so you've got me. Um, and really the intent of this report is to um, just outline the uh, outcomes of the community and social development team and also just to seek some approval for some of the monitoring and reporting um, framework that we are proposing within this report. Um, there have been questions at times around specific metrics for the work that this team do and I guess I just want to emphasise today that that is something that can be very difficult. This is, this team has largely a, a community support function. It's ideal that they can be as responsive as possible within the community and really just listening to Calvin as he was speaking, I think it's important to point out that um, you know, part of the reason I think that we were able to respond um, as effectively as we did is because of some of the relationships that we have within the community and the um, work undertaken by the uh, community Waikato and WISE group. Um, there was also a lot of support provided by our team in terms of connecting um, people up within that structure um, and also providing a lot of the des demographics and statistical information that was required to, to make that um, work um, and also providing support to the, the Claude Lins initiative. So it's really important that this team is as responsive as possible. Um, we work across a whole range of areas, um, um, some of which is too much to mention. <laughs> Sometimes I ask for more information. I'm, I'm often astounded at how involved within the community that this team is. But um, Certainly um, some of the work done around with the uh, Regional Housing Initiative and the Waikato Lands Trust um, currently undertaking a significant amount of engagement work. Um, I understand there was um, some input from the team around the transportation centre and access, um, input in currently into the Hamilton Gardens uh, uh, management plan and uh, ensuring that we get some really targeted engagement with key groups within the community. So um, yeah, happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Helen. So the, uh, the motion, which I'm happy to move if I have a seconder, uh, thank you, Councillor Kish, is that we receive the report and uh, take a look at um, points 39 to 42 because that's, we're, appro we're approving that as a reporting and monitoring framework. So questions, uh, Councillor McPherson. Uh, <coughs> thanks, Helen. On page 32, item 12, you've got... Um, the Waikato plan will be used as a primary vehicle to drive the recovery of Waikato post-COVID-19. That was news to me. I wasn't aware that we were looking at that as the, our primary planning document. I thought the Future Proof was, actually, and uh, a number of other associated pieces of work with that. Yeah, I think, um, so I understood um, around this time there was a proposal from the Waikato plan to be the primary vehicle, so it might have been when this report was written as well, and I think Amanda Hema came and spoke at this, at one of the um, committee meetings here. So I think what, actually what we mean by this, uh, that they've positioned themselves as a key vehicle, maybe primary is the wrong word there, Definitely. and that we'll align ourselves, so some of the initiatives that we've been, well, it's more around alignment that we're... Yeah, I, and I take that, but all of that's yet to be discussed. Yes, yes. And um, including Future Proof yep. being the primary driver as well, but uh, I think the decisions we've made about shovel ready and that, I don't think we once gone to the Waikato plan and say, is this in line with you or do you agree with it? I think yeah. we've decided around this table and our management. Yeah, so point taken, it's probably a, a wording. I think what we're, the intention there is that we're aligning ourselves to Waikato regional initiatives yeah. and not going sure. off on a different tangent. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. Thank you, Dave. Good, good spotting. Um, can uh, Mango to Ora? To Ua, big fan. Sorry, Ali. Thanks, um, Chair Mark. Um, Helen, thanks for the extensive um, report. So, just confirming the. Um, so, the Council's wellbeing framework that's going to be adopted by Council. Correct. In, in June this month. That's my understanding at this w when stage. We're about, so what, what um, form? So I'm not sure of the date of that. I think that's coming. Uh, do you know, Tracy, Julie Clarkson? Julie Clarkson will be presenting that at an upcoming meeting. Sorry, I don't have that date on me, Ollie. Yeah, I 
I'll, I'll have to check which committee that is, so we'll get back to you on that. Mm. Okay, Apologies thank you. For that. that was keen spotting going on here. Councillor Gallagher. Yes, just following on from Councillor McPherson's point vis-a-vis -vis future proof Waikato plan, um, th either to the chair or to you, um, would there be an intent to bring relevant um, staff or representatives from those groups so we can be crystal clear as to where we, we, we fit in? I mean, my own view is the Waikato plan still has to prove itself as the, as the vehicle. Yes. Future proof, I think, is beyond question. It's an excellent, excellent vehicle. Mm. Um, do you have any views? Because it just seems to me, rather than sort of make references to regional initiatives, we have to be crystal clear as to how we fit into those mm. and what they do for us. Mm, that's definitely something we um, want to um, really develop through our reporting framework is that it's not just us coming and reporting to, but that we're actually bringing in key partners um, and project leads of, um, of initiatives. So for example, with the Waikato plan, one of the projects that's been developed there is a uh, um, youth employment project in Crawshaw and Norton. Um, that's in its early development stages of project groups um, being, uh, currently being established for that. Um, but we'd be wanting to bring um, updates and um, actually bring in representatives from those groups. It just seems to me, and again, I'm seeking some uh, guidance, if you like, the role of this committee. I mean, we've had the newly formed Housing Trust. Mm. Uh, obviously, at an early stage, I want to get together and see their runs on the board. And I don't mean just an informal Zoom type session. I mean, coming <coughs> here in terms of the accountability for the money that we spend and the money that we spend on all these projects. And I'm perhaps seeking advice as to the means by which this committee can get down and do some, some significant work with these groups. Yes, so that's something that we can um, talk further with uh, Mark yeah. around. We've had some preliminary conversations around that. Um, so there are a number of reporting structures that we want to use, so through executive update and the GM report, and mm. um, if there are requests through that. So if we're updating regularly on the initiatives that are, um, that are happening, um, then we'd expect some requests for um, reporting or briefings or workshops through this committee. Mm. Mr Chair, question to you. I take it that you and your deputy will facilitate yep. these opportunities because I think this is this is the logical yeah, absolutely. committee. Be there okay, through, um, if we, if we can take that on board. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Helen, for your work here, and I appreciate this has been uh, there's been a few iterations to get to this point. Um, I'm just struggling a little bit to approve what is being asked today because we're we're, we're being asked to approve some measurements with metrics that we haven't decided on. Um, and then also the, so I would need to put this into a question. So how can we approve measurements when we haven't agreed to the metrics we're gonna use those measurements by in 40 mm. and 41? Mm. So I'm not specifically asking for approval of the measurements, but of the framework. So rather than coming up, uh, with a separate uh, set of metrics for you know the work that the community and social development team do, what um, what we are asking approval for is that um, those metrics are reflected through that um, that wellbeing framework. So not a separate set of wellbeing measures, but um, but that the work is reflected in those wellbeing metrics that will be coming to council at some stage. So it's more around the framework. So what we're asking is that that we have um, more narrative reporting through this committee, through the executive update mm -hmm. and through GM report, because I think that's really important for this, the type of work that this team does. I think um, understanding the initiatives that they're working on, and they might not have specific metrics against those initiatives, but we know that they are making an impact or, or provide an enabling or supportive role within the community. And that any metrics are captured through the wellbeing framework that will be coming to council. So what, I, what, what we're asking for approval for is actually not to have a separate set of metrics. So you're asking us for, forget about the metrics because we can't approve those, you're asking us to approve a, a wellbeing framework that we haven't got. Uh, that, that the framework for this, I'm asking you to approve that. The, the, any metrics associated with the work this team do are reported through that wellbeing framework. Okay, that we So it's more around the, I'm asking for the, the, report. the report on the framework, approval on the framework. Okay, I'll, I'll just park there for now. 
Thank you. Thanks. No, no, that's a good lot of questioning. Thank you. Councillor Nadu Rauf. Thank you. Um, Helen, um, so the report is quite um, broad, mm -hmm. um, and the team obviously have a huge um, role mm -hmm. that they play. Um, out of interest, how large is this team? Uh, the teams are uh, around uh, 14. So and that covers the whole city? Pardon? Covers the whole city, yes. And um, how, because uh, I note in one of your points, um, uh, where is it? 60% um, of our community live in, in the 40% most deprived areas of mm -hmm. New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So um, the team, is it, um, uh, how is um, the responsibilities prioritised? Yes, we have two teams um, broken up into community development and social development. And with the social development team, we've got some specific roles. So, um, you know, Jovi, who is our mm. ethnic advisor, um, we have a civic engagement role largely focused on engagement activities. Um, we have a Māori advisor and um, a disability advisor who also covers older people. So they have specific roles. Uh, focus areas within that. Um, and then we, and within our community development team, they have a more broader focus, but we're still trying to capture youth um, within that, um, but also places of interest. So, yeah. and that's where we've prioritised places like Enderley and Fairfield. Yeah. Um, so there's areas of high deprivation. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so does the team work closely? Because I, I see one of the outcomes is uh, inclusive community engagement takes place within diverse communities. Mm. Um, so does the team, is it linked to the comms team? Like how does... Yes. So we've um, developed a, um, a relationship with the comms team yeah. and um, we're supporting them with undertaking like targeted engagement. So either by working uh, with communities of place or communities of identity, whether that's youth or older people or disability, and um, ensuring that we get start to capture Got some you. voice. Yep. And um, last question, um, elected members, um, you know, we, are, we already have um, uh, links to the, into our communities. Mm. So where do you see, um, or do you see a role for elected members to play within this framework? Uh, yes, so definitely. So within the framework, that's uh, so putting in obviously that regular reporting and working with yourself and Mark specifically mm. around agenda items. Um, but also, uh, and a number of you have talked about it before, uh, making sure that you're aware of different events and activities that are coming up, network meetings obviously, um, making sure that we're taking good information into those network meetings. So what's happening within council, what are some things that we want to make the, the community aware of, where we want you know, to um, have their input. Mm -hmm. What are they? What is that community interested that we can also so that we're taking information out as well as getting information in? Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you. Yep. Yeah, Thank I think um, leveraging on your relationships mm. and then um, working closely with our team. So yep. I think that's really important uh, from a governance and, and staff level. So I think I think it's really good to have a governance face um, with the community and. And you may be hearing things that staff don't hear. I think that's mm. quite important too, if you can feed that back mm. through. Yeah. Oh, and so, and just, and just around, because the, the, their work is so broad, that sometimes, um, obviously, that, you know, what's a priority for, the, um, you know, for you as governance? That also helps to direct some of our activities. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Um, Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, thanks for the report, Helen. Are we going, I'm just looking at page um, 36, so I'm looking at the measurement of outcomes also, um, and you, you've just said ways including, and there's a, a four points there, and one of them is the quality of life biannual one. Are we still going to do the community profile surveys? Yes, we will still continue with those. And so how often do we do those? Um, Annually? We do them yep. annually. Yep. Okay. For updates on them. Yep. Yeah, okay. And so I guess once the well beings get um, approved by council, then that will help form um, questions. Because those, those particular surveys are, um, I think, are most valuable information uh, in, in terms of what, you know, what we'll want to try and deliver for the yep. well beings. Yeah. Okay, and um, 
All right, I'll leave the rest for debate. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor O'Leary. It's a lovely segue, actually. There's no more questions. Uh, yep. Oh, Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Just a qu question of clarity. Have you moved this? Uh, yes. Yes, I've moved it together. Because uh, I'd, ask, I'd ask a question. If, if you're not happy to, then I'll, I'll put forward an amendment. I just... And I, I'm not trying to be destructive or counterproductive, but I just feel like I cannot be approve a report and monitoring framework, which we don't have with metrics we haven't decided on. So my my amendment, or if it would be to receive the report, because this will come back in a month or with the framework anyway, and it will give us time to actually clarify all those elements. I just I just can't approve something that I can't see on something that I don't. It's 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 a ghost like amendment. Mm, I understand your point. Um, Can I make a suggestion? Yep. After staff report in B, put a comma and then say noting that community wellbeing metrics will be reported back to council for consideration. No, because it includes the framework too, which we don't we haven't approved. So okay. there's, there's metrics and a framework. We're asking to approve both, and we haven't got either. All right. Well, look, I'll. I'll See if there's an appetite around the room to put that uh, up as an amendment, uh, if you have a seconder, uh, that we just receive the report. I'll see if Councillor Okay. Amendment. All right, that's fantastic. We'll move on to uh, debate then. Um, and I'll, look, I'm just going to say thank you for the report. It's a, it's a complicated area. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like herding cats. And I appreciate that you have been quite wide, and I, I appreciate the intention of the framework, but I also appreciate the amendment. Mm -hmm. um, so... Councillor Hamilton, I'll ask you to speak to the amendment, if that's all right, Councillor O'Leary, and then we'll go with you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Look, totally um, supportive of what um, Helen's trying to do here, and, and it's, I know it's about a second iterations from previous staff, and you're trying to pull something together from Dr Bev's report, um, and I'll, I want to support that, but I'm just, just, just a technicality, I can't support something that I haven't, I haven't got, so um, I just hope that it'll come back, and, and we've been told June, but I, I don't, can't see that coming back in the next two weeks the framework that's in the report. So we've got to thrash that out and bring it back so that we've got comfort around supporting these initiatives and wellbeing. So happy to support and, and endorse it. All I'm asking is just let's just take that off the table until we've had more visibility around it. Um, really simple. So, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor O'Leary. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to be supporting the amendment. It's just make sense to me um, in terms of the right way to do things. Um, I, d I did want to uh, acknowledge that I think, you know, over the years I've seen many iterations of strategies and plans that involve community development. Um, and I um, think that the work that has now, I've just lost my page, think that the work that has been done on uh, from, from staff on the report and in terms of the strategy from... Um, Dr Gattenby has been great, but in particular what I've appreciated about this in the report on page 33 is that it feels like for once there's some concrete definitions um, of, you know, we talk about communities of interest and communities of place and all of these things, but actually now um, in the report, communities of place are defined by geographical location, communities of interest are brought together by a shared interest. You know, it talks about um, some of those uh, uh, precious communities like Enderley and Melville. Um, it talks about uh, ethnicity, gender, sexuality. It's very specific. It feels like there's some real meat on the bones now. Um, community has often, uh, the community development staff have often you know, had quite a rough ride um, in my 12 years because it's sort of often seen as a nice to, to have or nice to do out in the community and we send staff out there and, and they talk to people and that's really nice and we hold hands. But it's, <laughs> it's a lot more than that and I think um, Councillor Naidu Rolf's question around the team of 14 uh, community development team in a city of 170 odd thousand now uh, is uh, just uh, look. It's, it is a drop in the bucket, and more than ever did we see just how amazing um, Andy and the and his direct team are through the COVID um, lockdown and, and whole experience. So yeah, look forward to the measurements coming back. I'm particularly interested in those community profiles because they. They, they get right down to the nitty-gritty and it will help us as governors really 
as we move into the long-term plan, really put some resources in um, for, the, for the community development of our city. Thank you, Councillor O'Leary. Appreciate the words. Uh, Mangatua. Thanks, uh, Chair Mark. I support the amendment as well. I think it's, uh, um, yeah, it's good, be good to see the um, actual framework and the, and the metrics there. And I just um, yeah, speak um, to Councillor O'Leary's uh, point in terms of the great work that the community development team have done and do, and I think specifically during the Civil Defence activation, you really saw an alternative um, use of their relationships and skills to really uh, seamlessly flow into um, providing real value add um, for the city. I remember many times the ComDev team have been, you know, reviewed. Um, I think it's been a good um, for a record to show just how um, valuable the community development team is to the city during a time of, of an emergency. I think they really stepped up and um, did a great job. Um, really keen to see the framework coming forward with the metrics and obviously keen to um, see um, tangible outcomes reflected in those metrics, particularly in our communities of high social um, economic deprivation and you know those uh, communities Crawshaw, Norton and Fairfield and Andy, particularly Fairfield, every time I drive past Fairfield Hall and see the plywood uh, on the windows and the doors and the you know the kind of burn marks around, they're really keen to see um, what's going to happen there and when so um, that can um, function as part of that community going forward. Thank you Mr Chair. Kia ora. Uh, Councillor Gallagher. Acknowledge the uh, contribution of Councillor Leary and, and uh, Mangai Oli. Um, both uh, have really, I think, hit a nub. And I think one of the things I would remind you, and we often reference some good urban planning and how lovely this apartment is or these beautiful apartments are that are going up, where 98% of the people of this city, 95%, will not be able to afford to live in these kind of houses. And I'm not denigrating the great contribution that good urban design is, uh, but a whole lot of people can afford... Uh, to live in what we used to call the sausage blocks, uh, you know, the smaller ranch slider, you know, cell blocks with ranch sliders. What I want the community development team is, in our long-term plan, I want them to be front and centre of advising us. Because, you know, when the rubber hits the road, what are you doing in terms of infrastructure for uh, the suburbs that have been mentioned? You know, how can you improve the streetscape? Uh, how can you improve the urban design? How can you ensure that a kid doesn't have to play with a bit of a ball in a, in a crowded car park in a scungy flat as against being able to go to a nice sort of green space to kick a ball around and that kind of thing? Very important in terms of the Waikato plan. Get the Ministry of Education in those long-term plan meetings. Identify how schools can open their facilities up for better community uh, outcomes rather than schools with a fenced off field with some private security company saying to taxpayers, be off, go away, you pay the bills, but you can't come into our grounds after hours and your kids can't come into the grounds after hours. Scandalous, disgraceful. Uh, but so all I'm saying is, is, you know, no pretty speeches, please, no pretty reports, but can uh, our community development team and these other agencies join with us, picking up Angela and Ollie's point, because the critical point is going to be the LTP, OK? Mm. Mm. Where the rubber literally hits the road. And, and I think we can do some good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Uh, Councillor Nodi Ruff. Um, thank you. Just um, quickly. The, um, I think that the community um, development, oh, social, oh my gosh, it's stuff those words up. But I think the team is uh, highly valuable. Um, and they're continuously providing insight into the communities that they're in touch with. Um, I've had um, quite a few encounters with the team and I've found them very helpful. Um, they know the communities, they know the key stakeholders and they know exactly what's going on. Um, and um, I, I did ask the question about how large the team was and um, I quickly worked it out that it's one to 12,000 or thereabouts, um, the ratio of the amount of people that they're that they should be engaging with. Um, and, um, you know, this team, I think, are key to two of the well-beings um, that we should be responsible for in terms of um, social well-being and cultural well-being. Um, and um, they are the eyes and ears um, of this council 
and of our city. Um, you know, things like housing to community engagement, targeting areas of deprivation, um, working on youth engagement and ethnic engagement. It's huge areas. Um, and, um, and I'll be um, quite interested in this work going forward, uh, but more importantly in um, identifying gaps within this um, piece of work and how um, this can inform our decisions um, in the LTP. Thank you, Luke. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nadi Roof. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, um, Chair. First, I just wanted to acknowledge the amazing work that the community team does. I've had the privilege of working more closely with um, some of the staff around housing and the relationships that staff have um, with all different um, aspects of this. I guess, uh, the housing ecosystem and, and the community housing providers and regional housing initiative and researchers and all sorts um, is really impressive. So uh, we're in a really good position um, to collaborate and to work with partners because of that. And so I just wanted to acknowledge um, that work that's been happening there. Um, and just wanted to echo also, I think, uh, Kesha's comments around um, understanding where gaps are and where resources are most needed and also Angela's comments around um, those community profiles so that we can see where, when we come to the LTP, where um, investment is, is going to be, I guess, uh, most needed or um, best utilised. Um, and so, yeah, really looking forward to seeing some more work around that um, as we head towards LTP, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, Mayor Southgate. Or did you just push a button? I know I did. I thought you had your other sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, do you want to finish your mouthful? Dave, you were up there first. Sorry, mate. <laughs> okay. Thanks. thanks. Mr Chair, um, look, I just wanted to follow uh, Sarah and also on Angela's point about the importance of the community profiles because it's not just the soft work it's also the hard infrastructure, the hard community infrastructure that's important here. And you may, we will decide when there's an emergency, we need to put more money into some services. But when we're talking about LTP, we're talking about medium and long-term planning. And for that, that's where we can identify infrastructure deficits. And that's what in the past, distant past sometimes, community profiles have been very good at. They identified, for instance, that there was no decent community hall type facilities in the northern area um, about 15, 18 years ago. We ended up with the Western Community Centre as a result and all the things that are happening in and around and from that building. Um, so, and, and we often hear complaints around this table, justifiable, I think. Uh, look, you know, you've got the roads, you've got the houses and that, but what, where are the people going to go for recreation and uh, socialisation? And we don't sort of, we often put those sort of things at the end of the list uh, when someone sort of inadvertently, well, someone not inadvertently, some community complains about not being supported in that way. Um, it's better to have a plan for that sort of infrastructure up front, and I believe this sort of work is definitely going to help us. I'm uh, not sure that it's going to be all completed in time for the LTP. That's a worry, um, because I think we need at least the biggest gaps identified and fed into the LTP project. But given that we've got such a proactive chair and deputy chair, I'm sure they'll rectify any gaps in that time frame. You just leave it to us, Dave. <laughs> yeah, and general manager. Thanks very much. Mayor Southgate. Applaud staff as well for the amount of work that's gone into this. And... Um, it's really exciting for me to see so much of a focus on the broader community and social well-beings alongside the economic well-beings, which right now, of course, we've been um, focused on post-COVID. But at the bottom of the, at the end of the day, it's people that matter the most. And um, I think the team do a very good job. And Cash is right. They do a great, good job across the broad city. They're very stretched, actually. Very stretched. So this is not one area of council that I would like to see come under the um, cuts. It needs to remain. In fact, we need to strengthen it. We shouldn't be leaving any particular community behind. And at the moment, this is needed more than ever because we have some very thriving and robust communities 
and we have some communities that have been left behind and are struggling. <laughs> I've held a view for a long time that um, our community facilities need to be fit for purpose. When I've had these conversations when I was wearing your shoes, Mark, last, last term, which is how do we provide facilities and enable communities to care for themselves? Sadly, some of the physical facilities that we have are either coming towards the end of their life or sorely need a big amount of maintenance and pull through. Um, and if you don't believe me, you just need to go and stand in Fairfield Hall for, I'll give you three seconds to make your mind up at the state of that building. Um, and so, you know, going forward, I'm not blaming, I'm looking forward. I do want um, this work to inform the LTP so that we can put the right amount of resources around community wellbeing. Um, so you. as we build new communities that can have all the bright new shiny things, and should be built really well, we've got to remember that there's some existing communities. Um, and I recognise, for example, Councillor O'Leary as being an advocate for many years about the Frankton Plan. Um, and my understanding of the Frankton Plan, Angela, is that it's uh, on, only been scratched on the surface in terms of what is possible. So those are the kinds of things where we need to rebalance. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Southgate. Um, I won't be voting, though, M Mr Chair, because I wasn't in the ah, full. OK. All right. Um, Councillor Wilson, you, your name was up there. You've taken it off. Thank you. Um, look, I'll, I'll wrap up um, and say, I, as the mover of the motion, I'm quite happy that the, if the motion um, doesn't pass and I'll be supportive of the amendment um, when it comes through, I'll vote against it, but I'll vote for it down the track, if you know what I'm saying. Because the reason, the reason for that slightly complicated position um, is that I'm really glad that... Um, Ryan spotted that, and we are taking this seriously, and we want some decent measures. We want a little bit more information. Um, some, some really great points made during those speeches. Hold that thought. Please hold that thought as we head into our annual plan discussions, and hold that thought a bit longer as we head into LTP, because we're coming at you. Um, because we are serious about putting some serious investment and some serious measures around this, uh, this committee. Um, now more than ever, uh, Hamilton Kirikiriro is the most vulnerable, are the most vulnerable. Um, the statistics that are in here about, uh, or that Kesh was talking about before, about um, how we, uh, our poverty line uh, is not a statistic I'm proud of, um, and I'm really looking forward to the opportunity of doing it, uh, doing it seriously. Uh, community is front and centre to me. Um, I'm mindful of the discussions. We've only just finished with the annual plan where we were sitting there trying to defend keeping one of our community workers. Um, so... Let's take this seriously. Um, thank you for, to Councillor Dave for bringing in the infrastructure angle and the LTP. We will work hard. We will work really, really hard uh, towards that. But again, hold that thought. Um, I'd say a word to, um, uh, to our friends at Kainga Ora that this is a council that is, cons is very, very cognizant of our community infrastructure in all areas of town, in Flagstaff, in Enderley, in Norton, in Huntington, and in Crawshaw. We do take our most vulnerable seriously, and I say this is a council with a lot of heart, and we will defend our soul. There you go, Lance. So I will be voting for the motion, but if that fails, I'll be supporting the amendment. So with that, we will have to go to the board, Becca, 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 Becca. Be be um, so, Paula, you're not voting in this one? So we'll put up the amendment first, Councillor Ham Hamilton's amendment that we just... Yes, absolutely. Uh, can you please put up the amendment? And that is just that we re received the report. Yeah, so the amendment is just that we received the report. Okay, I'm currently Yeah, not yet, Paul. Okay, yeah, okay, cool. Oh, okay. Well, uh, the report. Yeah, you've, you've um, read the report. And I'm, I've um, been appraised of the amendment, so I'm, I'm, I know I'm happy what I'm... that you vote if you, if you want to. Um, <coughs> objection, right? That's okay, the cool. um, advice of staff. That's fine, that's fine, buddy. That's fine. The decision we're making is about the amendment, and that is that we receive the report only. Um, those, uh, so we'll go to the board for that one. Are we all there? Yeah. Okay, so the amendment uh, now becomes a substantive motion. Yes, sorry. Could I just call it? Yeah. Uh, so the amendment is carried, 843 against, noting that Councillor Thompson voted against the matter via audio visual link. Oh, so that is actually... 
Uh, sorry, for against. For against. Happy with that? Everyone understand? Okay, so the amendment now becomes a substantive motion. The amendment is that we, or the motion is now that we receive the report. To the board, please. The amendment as a substantive motion is declared carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Now, it's nine minutes to one. We have, um, I think we can fit one more item in, and that is the uh, to Inaway uh, Park naming. Jen Parlane, I saw her here before. Taking a phone call. That'd be great. Okay, but uh, just for your reference, it's page 55. So we're aiming to get to lunch as close as we can to one, uh, to come back at 1.45 for the pool and then the um, Captain Hamilton. So, Jen, with, this is item number 12. It's all yours. Seconded. Thanks, Dave. Would you want to speak to the report? Or we... All right, any questions around the renaming of Te Park? All right, well, with no questions. Oh, it didn't come up on the. Oh, there we go. Is this a, is a question, Councillor Gallagher? Or we, is this no, debate? just to no, in the debate. Okay, cool. All right, well, no more questions. We'll move to debate. Councillor McPherson, would you like to say anything? No. Councillor Gallagher. A good foretaste of the future that uh, <coughs> the Council of Kiriki or Hamilton is acknowledging its totality of human history and settlement, which is hundreds of years old. And uh, one believes that this naming of this park starts to acknowledge that. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I've got nothing to add. Councillor McPherson, anything to add as a right of reply? What he said. What he said. Hang on a minute. I've seen that before somewhere. Uh, thank you, Jen, for your stunning answers. Um, all right. <laughs> so the motion is up there on the board. Well, was there up on the board? Okay, thank you. So we're moving those together. So all those in favour, show of hands, we'll go with that one. Oh, big pun. Yeah, I'm the seconder, yep. Those in favour, noting that Councillor Thompson's there. And those against? The motion is carried unanimously. Look at that. Hey, well, look, we might be able to squeeze the pools in before lunch. Joking, joking, joking. All right, well, with that, with that in mind... Um, we're actually going to have a 51-minute lunch break today. Um, so we will resume at 1.45 and we'll be on to the pools and then we'll be on to Captain Hamilton. Thanks, guys. Great work so far. <laughs>